Hey, what's up guys? Today we are going to be making what is by far the most requested ring build on my entire YouTube channel. Let's do it.
that's the video. Hey, what's up guys? Today we're going to be making a ring unlike anything I've ever created. It's going to be really unique and I have really high hopes for it. Let's go over kind of the basic idea and design of the ring. First, it's going to have an AstroTech liner to it. It's gonna be a clear ring. I'm not gonna add any pigments to it. And then I'm going to use two different sizes of rough diamonds. These are amazing, they look beautiful. And I'm also going to sprinkle in both green and blue glow powder. So the whole thing is gonna be kind of translucent. It's going to sparkle from the diamonds. It's also gonna have sort of a kind of starry night look to it when it's glowing in the dark. So it should look amazing. The first step is going to be using this brass to create a blank that I can make a mold out of that we will use the AstroTech epoxy to pour into. Then we'll go ahead and get started on the inlaying steps and go from there. Let's go ahead and jump right into it. All right, now I'll take my mold and I'll use some AstroTech Jewelry Grade Epoxy, mix it up and we'll pour it in there. We just need to put this in the vacuum. That way the resin will seep perfectly down into the recess of the ring blank. That will get rid of all of the bubbles and make sure that the resin is able to fill down into the mold perfectly. All right, now we'll just let it cure overnight, make sure that it's fully hardened. and I'll carefully use a jeweler's handsaw to separate the blank from the excess resin. Now I'll quickly flatten out the edge, get it flush where I want it. I'm not going to polish it or anything like that. We'll do all of that later.
for now, what I'm going to do is switch over to my lathe. And I need to cut a groove into the blank. We'll use that to inlay all of the diamond pieces. Now I'll use my Astrotech UV hardening resin to put a first layer down. If you didn't know, the way this works is it's a resin that cures from UV light. And so it makes it really helpful because depending on how much UV light you use, you can kind of select how hard or tacky you want it to get. So I'm putting down a really thin layer. I'm only hardening it slightly. That way it's still tacky. That way the diamonds will hold on to it. Then I'm going to take away the UV light. I'm going to do all of the inlaying process and I'll fully cure it later using a lot more UV light. All right, after a few minutes in the UV bath, we've got it fully hardened. The diamonds are completely secured in there. Now I'm going to go ahead and sprinkle in the glow powders. And I've picked to use blue and green because I think they'll go really nicely together. I want to give this kind of a starry night, just almost galactic look to it. So I think these will combine and do a really good job of that. My strategy here is to just dab a little bit of UV resin in places that I want to target with a high concentration of the glow powder, but I don't want to do that everywhere. So on some parts of the ring, I just do a really light dusting. That'll really help kind of give it that kind of starry night look. Now once I've got that all set in place, it's time to just go ahead and do another layer two of the UV resin. And again, I'll throw that in the UV bath. This time I'm giving it plenty of time to fully cure all the way. Because if I don't wait and I start sanding into it, it'll start to gum up and it'll ruin the entire inlay. All right, now I just need to do a quick sanding and polishing to the outside. I'll also do a quick one to the inside.
Hey, what's up guys? In today's video, I'm going to be making what is by far the most technical ring I've ever made. It's going to include over 30 individual components and that includes a bunch of different pieces of rose gold, black diamonds, as well as some fordite I've got here. I'm gonna be using all sorts of equipment. I'm gonna be using my lathe, mill, my soldering torch, and even my laser welder from Orion Welders. So it's going to be crazy, but if you stick around to the end, I promise you this video is going to be worth it. Let's go ahead and get into it. First, let's quickly talk about the design of the ring. The right half is mainly Fordite, and then the left half is mainly rose gold. Fordite has a lot of layers, so depending on how I shape it, I can reveal a lot of different patterns and colors, so you'll notice that a lot of the design is based around exposing as much of the Fordite layers as possible. The final main feature of the ring will be 12 rose gold rods that will go through the Fordite and then be exposed in the middle of the ring. And then I'll also set a black diamond into each of the ends of the rods, which should really add to the look of the ring. Now there are a lot of very tight tolerances and tiny features on this ring, so it was very important that I made a very specific and carefully thought out plan for the ring, which I did, and I'll get started on it now. First, I'm going to prepare the rose gold liner to be soldered to one of two outer rose gold rings, and I machine it precisely that way the second piece falls into place perfectly. Any soldering needs to be completed before I add the Fordite because it will burn. So later on, I will rely on my laser welder in order to weld the rose gold without having to overheat the Fordite. Next, I'll be drilling all of the holes for the rose gold rods to be inserted to. And for this, I used my mill with my rotary table because precision is really important for this step if I want the ring to look like it was very well made. Next, I will very carefully shave down the inner lip of the ring to make space for a Fordite piece to slot into. And I machine it down until it's just one third of a millimeter thick. And there's three reasons I didn't just shave it away completely. The first is practical. It gives me a very large surface for the Fordite to glue onto, making the bond very strong and very secure. Second is so that the ring, when viewed from the inside, will be 50% Fordite and 50% rose gold right down the middle. This way I can show off the unique patterns that the Fordite has that aren't really shown anywhere else on the ring. And third, the small layer of rose gold that is left will be visible at the bottom of the exposed channel that the rose gold rods are going to go through. And I thought this would just look better uh, compared to Fordite in this scenario. Now it's time to select a piece of Fordite to cut out for the ring. And this is one of the very most important steps because it will have a huge effect on the overall look of the ring. So I'm looking for a piece that has a lot of swirls and deformities in it because that will give us the most interesting and colorful patterns. And a really big issue here is that most of the pieces that are gonna be interesting are gonna have large air gaps in them. So the end result would be a piece of Fordite that would fall apart once I cut it out. So to remedy this, I'm going to be stabilizing this entire piece of Fordite with AstroTech Epoxy. And this process alone will take over a day to complete, but the results it will give us will be well worth the time it requires. I've chosen black as the color to add to the epoxy. This should make things very subtle and not distract from the natural beauty of the Fordite. But to make it a little extra special, I'm going to be adding just a slight amount of pearlescent pigment to it. So this will give it a shimmer that includes silver, purple, blue, as well as gold. 
And the biggest reason I did it is because it'll match this slight shimmer that Fordite naturally has to it, and that's due to the metallic paints used in the car paint that it's actually made of. So I cover the entire piece in epoxy, then place it in my vacuum chamber. This step is critical in order to fill every single little gap in the Fordite. After 24 hours of cure time, I sanded down that excess AstroTech epoxy layer on the top in order to reveal those beautiful Fordite patterns beneath. And this gives me a better idea on where I should cut my blank from in order to get the best patterns. Now cutting out a blank will be really simple. I'm just going to use my diamond hole saws for that. And here it is ready to go. As you can see, it's looking amazing so far. Let's go ahead and get on to the next step. Now I'll machine it to size and get it ready to be used on the ring. And again, dimensional accuracy is super important on this ring. Where the Fordite sleeves onto the inside of the rose gold, the Fordite will be less than one millimeter thick. So that means my lathe has to be tuned just right. My expanding ring mandrels need to spin perfectly true. So of course, shameless plug here, I'm gonna be using my Patrick Adair Supplies brand mandrels for that. And then I need to measure the Fordite with calipers after every single pass in my lathe in order to ensure the fitment is just right. If it's not, I'll end up sanding straight through the Fordite, which will at best expose the gold, and at worst, the ring will fall apart. But either way, the ring would be completely ruined, so it's absolutely critical. Just as kind of a side note, this ring was very stressful to make just because of that reason that almost every single step required precision to the point where if it wasn't spot on, the ring would just be ruined beyond repair. But I was able to successfully machine the Fordite to just the right size and everything is looking great so far. So enough pessimism, let's just be positive, let's get this finished. Now I'm going to use my Fordham to drill out holes for the rose gold rods. And I'm using the carefully cut holes in the rose gold as a guide. This allows me to drill by hand and still will be accurate, which saves me a bunch of time. Next, I'll shave the Fordite down to its final dimensions and give it a quick sanding and polish. Now I'll use a carbide chamfer bit to chamfer each hole in the Fordite. This allows me to set diamonds just below the surface of the Fordite so that it doesn't snag on anything. And it also has the wonderful benefit of exposing all sorts of interesting details in the Fordite that would otherwise be hidden below the surface. Now let's make those rose gold rods I've been talking about this whole time. Each one needs to be five millimeters long and have a black diamond set into it. Here I'm using a setting punch to bend the edges of the gold over the lip of the diamond in order to hold it in place. And none of the steps involved with this step are super challenging necessarily, but because I am doing 12 of these, I need to make sure I make each one carefully in order to make them all look identical.
Now it's finally time to break out the Orion laser welder. This is a machine that has very quickly become an invaluable part of my tool arsenal. It allows me to make rings that would otherwise be impossible for various reasons, whether the parts I need to join are very small, are made of dissimilar materials that otherwise wouldn't join together, or in this case, because the work pieces can't be heated to a high temperature without destroying it. So welding each rod in place is very straightforward. I have the laser set to a fairly low power, but I turn the number of milliseconds per laser burst up, which helps give me a large and secure weld without vaporizing much material. And I just wanted to mention, being able to hold the workpiece in my hands makes things just so much more convenient here. I can instantly just tack a gold rod in place, then I check if the positioning and fitment of it's perfect, then I can quickly adjust it, or I can continue on if it's ready to go. It turns a tedious soldering job into a quick and easy laser weld that leaves me with a bond that's stronger than any solder. Okay, now they've all been soldered into place and the ring is really starting to resemble the finished product that I'm shooting for. So that was super encouraging because I spent just so many hours and hours on this ring up until this point. Next, I'll be adding the final band of Fordite to the ring and I'll trim it down to size. All right, now we're down to the final piece and it's the final band of rose gold that will sleeve onto the end of the ring. And again, I can't solder the ring right now, so I'll need to use the laser welder. This time I'm going to be using a filler wire that's also made of rose gold. And I need to use this if I want to get a seamless connection between the two pieces because every time the laser zaps the gold, it vaporizes a very small amount of the material, leaving a little pockmark in the gold. So the wire filler avoids that altogether while still securely welding the two pieces together. Now everything is finally in place. I'll just do a bit of trimming, sanding, polishing, and cleaning, and we'll be finished. And I'm going to have a ton of photos of the ring that I hope you'll stick around for because this ring has so much detail that you really need to see it from a lot of different angles in order to fully appreciate all that it has to offer. Here it is in its final glory, and I can't tell you how good it feels to see it all finished and looking the way it does. I put over 80 hours of labor into this ring, and I think it shows it just has so many details and features, and they all came together so beautifully. I could just spend hours looking at this ring. Hey guys, welcome to my channel. And if you didn't know, today's video is actually going to be part two of a collaboration that I did with the King of Random. And so in the first part, we turned molten brass and meteorite shavings into these rods that you can see here. And then in today's video, part two, that's where we're going to be machining them into rings. So if you're a subscriber of mine and you missed their first video, I'm going to have a link to that down in the description. And if you're a subscriber of the King of Random and this is your first time to my channel, I just wanted to take a second, say welcome to the channel, and I hope you really enjoy this this video. And before we get started, I just want to do announce that I am going to be doing a giveaway. I'll have more details about that later, but for now, let's go ahead and get started. Our first step is going to be taking our rods here, and I need to grind them into more of a rounded shape. They need to fit inside of the lathe jaws on the lathe that I have. And so right now, especially this piece, it's not very round. And so I'm going to be grinding them away into just a better shape that we can fit into our lathe. Thank you. 
So this step actually did take quite a long time to complete, but eventually, as you can see here, I'm left with four rods that were able to fit into my lathe. And you can see on some of them, I had to put these notches in there to make it a little bit easier on me so I could do a little bit less sanding. But as you can see here, there are plenty of shavings. I spent probably an hour just grinding these away. So now the pieces will actually fit into the lathe, but they don't have a very firm and secure grip on there. So what I'm doing in this step is I'm machining them down with this tungsten carbide lathe bit, and that'll give it a perfectly round outer diameter. That way I can flip this around, put it back in my lathe jaws, and it'll have a much better grip. Looks like you're changing and all. But why didn't you, why didn't you call? Now that I have the piece securely held in place on the lathe, I'm able to start trimming down the other side of it. And all I'm going to be doing here is just trimming it down till it's flush with that other side there. And then once we have it to that step, we'll have it in a better rod shape. And I'll just repeat this step on all the different pieces until we have all of our nice smooth rods ready to go. And then we'll start machining the actual rings out of them. Now a couple hours later, I've got these four rods ready to go, and I was actually really impressed with how well these held up to this point. I had a lot of concerns going into this about the structural integrity of the pieces, but after machining them for a while and getting a feel for it, I actually found they were quite durable and I didn't have any pieces come out on me, so I was very impressed with the strength of these. Now for this next step, I'm using a boring bar and I'm cutting away at the inside of the ring, and then I use calipers and measure as I go, and then I stop once I'm at the final diameter that I want. Now after a few minutes, I've got the dimensions that I want for a ring, and so I'm using this parting off tool and I'm just cutting away the ring from the rest of our material. Now the next step is going to be sanding and polishing the ring, and so I start off with a really rough Dremel, and the purpose of this is to round off some of those corners. I make sure this is a really comfortable ring to wear, and then I go through all the different grits of sandpaper until I get this up to a really nice finish, and then after that, I'll be doing some actual polishing with a polishing wheel.
So my first polishing step is going to be the inside of the ring. My buffing wheel can't fit inside of here and so I need to do this by hand. And so I have it in the lathe here and I just have a little bit of polishing compound put on this paper towel. And you can see that very quickly gets this up to a nice perfect and glossy finish. And then for the outside of the ring, I start with a rough polish. This will get rid of any of the minor imperfections that we had after sanding. And then after that, I switch over to the right and I use this high polish and that's what gives us that really glossy mirror finish. All right, so we've got two rings finished here and then we've got a third one on the way. You can see this one, I put a carbon fiber liner on the inside, that's to reinforce it, make sure it stays strong and then we had to reinforce it with some CA adhesive. But overall, I think we're left with a cool ring and we've got two big chunks of meteorite that I think we're going to be able to etch and be able to see the uh, meteorite pattern on. So I'm really excited to do some experimenting with that. This one as well, I think has just a little spot that we're gonna be able to see um, some of that pattern on. Let's see, the piece itself is right here. So I think that's gonna be very interesting. And then this one I still am working on. Um, it should be finished soon. I'll have photos of it at the end of the video. But this one should be interesting. So we've got our uh, brass and meteorite piece here. And then on the inside, I'm going to reinforce it with this galaxy resin that I mixed up. So onto the etching in the acid. What I'm going to do is I've got a cup of muriatic acid right here. And then this is a cup of hydrogen peroxide. The acid will etch the meteorite. So it'll reveal that really cool pattern that we're going for. And then we've got the hydrogen peroxide, that's an oxidizer, and so it's going to speed up our reaction. So we're going to put the acid and the peroxide in here, and then be etching them in there. This is going to mess up the finish on the brass, but that's okay, we can polish it away, and we'll be left with um, perfect results. And then right here, this is a cup with water and baking soda in it. That is to put anything that gets acid on it. So this will neutralize it, make sure it's safe. To me, why don't you do it right now? You know we met for a reason, but you're trying to deny. Okay, so we'll just give that a couple minutes and then we'll move on to etching this one. Okay, so it's been about 15 minutes. This has been just sitting in the acid. And you can see we got a nice etch on the meteorite. It's such a small piece that there's not a lot visible on there. But once we polish this up, we'll be able to get a much better look at it. I'm going to put this in the baking soda water. It just neutralizes it, makes it safe. I'll set this aside and then I'm going to get a new batch of acid. Okay, I've got the acid ready and I'm just gonna drop the ring right in. All right, so this ring is done as well. Put it in the baking soda and so far, so good. We've got the pattern showing there that just looks awesome. This piece is also showing it. So perfect results, exactly how we wanted it. Now we need to go in and polish the brass part on it. All right guys, we got both the rings finished. I think they turned out beautifully. I could not be happier with the way it worked out. We were able to get that pattern of the meteorite to show on this ring. And then this one just looks really natural. I like that rough edge that it has on there. And you can see all the different meteorite shavings and things like that. So very fun, very interesting project. I just wanted to give a huge thanks to both Nate and Grant for helping make this video possible. What's up guys? In today's video, we're gonna be going a little bit crazy. We're going to involve five different ingredients in today's ring. We're going to start out with forged carbon fiber, which is a material that I haven't used in a YouTube video before. This is a proprietary blend of forged carbon fiber that came from Carbon 6, and they're a ring company. I'm a big fan of theirs. I've been friends with John Paul, their CEO, for a little while, and I actually just went out to New York and met with him, and he gave me some samples of the forged carbon fiber. So I'm super excited to start working with this today. And then we are going to be adding an NFC reader into the ring. And so this will allow you to perform just certain just functions with your phone. We're gonna show you a lot more about that at the end of the video. This will make the ring really interesting. You can do stuff like open a certain URL, turn the flashlight on on your phone, a bunch of different things like that. And then just the whole like kind of theme behind the ring is gonna be kind of a cyborg, cyberpunk thing. And so I decided we should integrate as much glow as we can. So we're gonna add some tritium vials here. And then we've got some strontium aluminate glow powder here. So we're gonna cover all uh, ends of the glow spectrum here. And then over here, these are just circuit board components. The, I, I'm assuming some of them could be like a little transistor, diodes, timers, 
whatever. They're just little tiny rectangular circuit board components. And so we're going to be integrating that into the design of the ring. Overall, this is going to be a crazy ring and it's going to have a really cool functionality behind it. So I'm really excited to get started on it and I'm really excited to show you guys the functionality at the end. So stick around for that. Anyways, let's go ahead and get started. So to start off, I'm going to be machining a blank out of the forged carbon fiber. And one thing that's great about forged carbon fiber is because it's so blended and the way the strands of the carbon fiber are swirled in there, there's no like layers to it. And it's a little tricky to explain kind of what I mean here, but if you think of regular carbon fiber and the way that it's made, it's just a bunch of sheets of carbon fiber stacked up together. And so what you end up having is just a layer of resin in between each layer that makes a weak spot in the carbon fiber. So if you try to machine it, if you're not very careful you can have it split along those layers and so what forged carbon fiber does by having all of the material blended in there there's no large weak areas like that standard stacked carbon fiber would have so in practice this means that forged carbon fiber is a lot easier to machine without having to worry about it splitting or chipping anything like that So now that I've got a basic ring blank shape cut out, we're going to carve a groove into the center of it, and it needs to be just wide enough for our NFC chip to fit in there. Now that I have the groove carved, I'm ready to place the NFC chip in there and glue it in place. Now I had a bit of an issue with the CA adhesive running and causing it to get all over the ring where I just wanted it to be over the chip itself, but that wasn't too big of a problem. I just used this razor blade here and carefully chipped it away, and that way we can have room to add all of the circuit board components that I wanted to add. Now it's time to start placing in some of these circuit board components. And to be clear, these aren't actually functional. It's not going to change anything to the ring. It's not gonna improve the range, anything like that. It's just for show. And I think they really do add to the overall appearance of the ring. They make it look just a little bit more techy, cyborgy, whatever you wanna call it. And my strategy here was to make an arrangement of the chips that looked interesting and cool, but one that didn't look like it wasn't just for show. So I wanted it to still look like it was functional. I wanted there to be at least some sort of organization to it. And so that was the strategy behind the placement of them. I wanted to have them placed evenly, consistently, and I was doing this by hand, so it was a little bit tricky. So I was just as careful as I could to get the placement how I wanted. And then I just wanted them to be really organized. So I did everything in a grid pattern and make sure everything was aligned properly. Now I've got all of those circuit board components in place and I wanted to add glow powder to fill in all of the areas around them. And this was a little bit tricky. I didn't want to cover up any of the chips and to have any of the dust showing on top of the chips. And so I was really careful to just place it in the cracks and then I used a combination of my finger, a damp paper towel, as well as my pair of tweezers here, just to dust any of the glow powder off where I didn't want it. Now I have everything in place except for the tritium vials and you'll see how I add those in a second. But for now, I'm just adding a bunch of CA adhesive over all of our components. That's going to set it all in place permanently and going to provide a clear and protective layer above everything. Now what you see me doing is carving out a channel for two tritium vials and I'm going to have one on each side of our NFC reader. And the reason I'm doing it this way is because I want to be able to put away the glow powder and not have any chance of getting dust in there. The overall look of the ring won't look as clean if there's just dust particles of that glow powder just floating around randomly in our CA adhesive. 
So this was all done in an attempt to preserve the clean look of the ring. Now I'm placing the tritium vials using the exact same method I used before on those circuit board components. I'm just putting it in place, gluing it where I want it, and then filling the rest up with the CA adhesive that'll give it a clear and protective covering. That way we won't have any issues with these shattering. Now all I have left to do is sand everything flush and polish it up. And so you'll see me sand it all smooth and then I'll just go through all the different grits of sandpaper and get rid of any of the scratches that are in there. And then I will of course polish it. That'll make sure the carbon fiber is smooth, shiny and comfortable. And then that the resin itself is crystal clear. That way we can see down through it and see all the interesting details that this ring has. And as a finishing touch, I wanted to add bevels to the ring. And this is a challenge with carbon fiber because it's such a soft material. If I were to use my lathe bit to do this, it would leave a nice bevel and it would be even, but the edges of it would be rough. And so I'd have to use sandpaper to get rid of that. And long story short, basically that would round out those bevels and not make them look as good. And so you wanna do as few of steps as possible. So I'm basically going to be skipping straight to a really high grit sandpaper, and I'm going to be using the Dremel to put those bevels into place. And so I'm holding it as carefully as I can at a 45 degree angle and I'm carefully just adding those bevels to it. And because the sandpaper is so smooth, it leaves us with an acceptable surface finish that all I need to do now is use a buffing wheel at the end and that will polish it up and that way we won't have any of those sanding marks left in it and we'll still have those nice crisp bevels that we were going for. Now I need to size up the ring and make it an appropriate thickness. And so I'm using a rough Dremel wheel to do that. And this is creating a ton of carbon fiber dust. And that can be very damaging to your respiratory system because carbon never breaks down in your body. And so I was very careful to make sure that I was wearing a respiratory mask for this. That way I didn't inhale any of those carbon fibers. And if you're doing this at home, make sure you always are wearing a mask. Now that I've got it to size, I'm using sandpaper to smooth it all out. I'm making it look good as well as making it fit comfortably. Now all that's left to do is polish up the ring. So to do that on the inside, I'm using a bit of compound on this paper towel that makes it nice, smooth, and shiny. And then I'll be switching over to my buffing wheel here, and I'll use that to polish up the outside of the ring.
Hey, what's up, my dudes? Today I've got another superconductor ring video for you. And now the story behind this ring is that I had a customer who wants a ring that's very similar, but made out of a different material. So I had the idea to do a practice of it first because I, I wanted to do that anyways in the first place, but I thought it would look really cool in superconductor. So I decided to experiment, do it with that. And then I figured why not turn it into a YouTube video as well. And I actually really do like the results. So I'll probably add it as an option to my website. And you'll see the end result, it's actually really cool. And it's, it might be something I wanna add to my website. Um, it is actually a really time consuming process, so it might not even be worth my time to offer these on there. Um, but let me know what you think. Give me some feedback down below if you think it'd be worth it for me to throw it up on the website. If you guys are interested, I'll do my best to get it on the site. So first off, I'm cutting off a piece from my tilted superconductor rod. And I did think this ring would look much better with the tilted superconductor on there. So that's why you see me cutting off the tilted piece. It's not just because it was the easiest piece I had on hand. I actually do think that having the uh, superconductor rods themselves sticking out at a bit of an angle after I etch this in acid, I think that's going to look really cool. So after a few minutes of cutting on the metal bandsaw, I'm able to cut all the way through and I've got this kind of skiwampus cookie shape here. And in order to fit this into my lathe jaws, I actually need to trim down those oblong edges. And so I'm just going to manually sand that down on my belt sander. I went through two sanding belts just on this step. So I definitely got the 10 pack of sanding belts ready to go just because I'm just going through these like crazy. Now you'll see I stopped before it's perfectly circled. That's okay. I just need it to fit in the lathe jaws. And then once I can get that hole drilled out in the center and then have it mounted onto the ring mandrel, then I can true it all up and make sure everything's smooth and flat and how it should be. So to bore it out, I'm just using this center drill. These are made specifically for lathes and they're just a really sturdy drill bit that you can just plunge straight into hard materials just like this superconductor and they, they're really durable and they're able to cut through it like, and they're able to cut through it like almost nothing else will. But that's not to say that it's not still a very difficult process to cut through superconductor. It's actually really difficult the titanium in the superconductor makes it really hard to machine. And then also the copper surrounding it is incredibly hard to work with. It work hardens as you go. And it's also a really gummy material. So it's getting gummed up and also hardening and causing problems there. So you go through drill bits like crazy. I'm only going to get this one use out of this drill bit before I need to flip it around. And then I'll get probably one more use out of that on another superconductor piece and this thing will be garbage. So superconductor is definitely a really rough material to work with. It uses up a bunch of tooling. Now that I've got the live center all the way through, I'm going to switch to a boring bar and then I'm using the tungsten carbide bit on that. And then I'm continuing the process I started. So I'm just hollowing it out more and more until I can get it to fit on the ring mandrel. Now that I've got that hollowed out, I'm putting my expanding ring mandrel on the lathe jaws. And by the way, I get a lot of questions in the comments of where to buy these. You just go to bangleguy.com. He's got them on there. They're a really handy tool to have around the shop. And if you don't want to buy one from him, if you're tight on cash or something, you can easily make one yourself. It's a really fun lathe project. So if you're wanting to make rings on your lathe or you're looking for lathe projects, then why not make a ring mandrel? And if you're interested, let me know in the comments. I could post a tutorial on how to do that. I'm definitely no expert, but I'm sure I'd be able to manage and cut out a decent one of these. Okay, so I've got the ring blank on the mandrel and I'm using my left-handed lathe cutter and I'm just trimming down the outside diameter slowly. Just, And I'm doing this slowly, just about a half a millimeter at a time. And eventually I get through all the surrounding copper that goes around the superconductor filaments. And then I get to the part of the ring where it's mostly those superconductor filaments. 
And because I'm not making this ring for a specific person or purpose, I decided to pick and choose the pattern I wanted rather than the size I wanted. So I just cut into the superconductor until I saw a pattern that I thought was really cool. And then I will make the size according to the outside diameter. So it's kind of opposite most of the time. So this is an interesting ring. It was fun to make like that. But it did turn out to be a pretty big ring though. All right, now I've got the ring blank back in the lathe jaws. I need to widen the inner diameter of it so it's not such a fat ring. Then once I've got that widened, I'm using my Dremel tool with a coarse sanding wheel on it. And I'm rounding out the edges so it has a nice comfort finish to it. And then you'll also notice that that lathe bit, if you're not really careful, and I wasn't super careful on this one, it can leave a really kind of gross smeared finish to the superconductor. So I'm also using the sander to grind that away and get a really nice clean surface finish on there. And then of course at the end I switched to a finer Dremel sanding wheel and then I used that to clean up the inside and give it a smoother finish. But I'm going to take it a step further for this ring. I'm going to take it over to my sanding wheel and then put a whole bunch of bevels and angles all over this ring and it'll give it what I call an obsidian finish to this. And you'll see I have this option on my website for some of the carbon fiber rings as well as I used to do them for the Damascus steel rings as well. But the process is a little bit different for this. You can't hand forge that finish on there. And then for the carbon fiber ones, I like to use a Dremel wheel to do that because it makes the shape a little bit more interesting. But obviously with this superconductor, I wouldn't be able to do that. So you can see the process I'm using, it's fairly simple, but it's just very time consuming. I've got the sanding table set up and it lets me do a bunch of different angles on the ring. So all I do is I put about three to four bevels onto the ring, I just sand a flat surface onto it, and then I'll adjust that angle to be a bit more steep, and then repeat the process. Obviously I'm flipping the ring 180 degrees a couple times throughout the whole process so that I get it even on both sides. And you'll see when I show it off on the camera how these steps progress. You can see it slowly transform from that normal ring look that we had to this really cool angular obsidian finish. All right, here that is. You can see it's got all those really cool faces to it. It looks really cool under especially multiple different light sources. It's got a bunch of different reflections that show off all those faceted edges. So I think it looks really cool. And this is a ring that I think will look really cool with a deep etch. So I'm etching it over the span of about 12 hours. 
So off camera, I just had it in here all day. I was just flipping it over every 30 minutes to an hour every time I'd think of it. And that was to make sure I got an even consistent etch to it. And then once that was done, I pull it out and you'll see just how cool this thing turns out. We still have one more step to do, but this thing's looking great. So now I'm going to throw it into the rock tumbler. This will scrape away that reddish pinkish coating that the copper had over it. And then it'll also round away some of the sharper edges that this had. And I didn't have enough time to do this as long as I would have liked to for the video, just because I wanted to get this out sooner. So I only got it in there for a few hours, whereas after I post this video, I'm gonna leave that in there for about four days and that'll make it a lot better. And it'll also help to hide some of the scratching from the sander that was on there. The reason that it had those scratches in it is because I'm waiting for some finer sandpaper discs to show up. But because this is a prototype, I figured it'd be okay for this one. So if you see those scratches and it kind of annoys you, just know I'm triggered too. I really wish I had some finer sandpaper discs for this, but who knows, maybe the rock tumbler will do a really nice job and end up hiding those all together, so we'll see. All right, and after pulling it out, this thing is finished. Definitely be sure to let me know what you think down in the comments. And now one thing that I noticed after filming this was that I actually didn't like the look of it on camera as much as I did in person. And I was trying to figure that out, and I think the reason for that was because doing it with all the soft lighting and video equipment that I had, well, where I try to get really even consistent lighting, and that's good for most rings and most things, but that's not really where this ring shines, and I mean that literally where it shines, and what makes it cool is all those different faceted edges that it has. successfully able to breach the mainframe and hack right into the motherboard. So we're able to access the BIOS. So now, if you'll see here, this is how we can actually buy tritium. It is a very, it's an illegal substance. So using this hacked mainframe, we can now purchase some tritium. So let's see, let's go for, what, what color are we like in? Green, green's usually the brightest glow color. We'll go with green. Let's get 20 of these bad boys. Add to cart. Ooh. All right, now we're using the hacked version of PayPal. It's like PayPal, but it's hacked. You know, I forgot my hacked PayPal password. Better pull that up. All right, so we were successfully able to order the tritium. Now we did maybe embellish the process of ordering it just a little bit, um, but it actually is illegal to sell tritium in the US, but it's not illegal to buy tritium in the US. So we were able to go to an Asian distributor, buy it from them, and they're gonna ship it to us. And that was legal. We just can't like get it on eBay or any other standardized website because it's illegal to sell for whatever reason. And if you don't know what tritium is, it's actually hydrogen, but it undergoes a process that makes it slightly radioactive and it's not enough that it could ever be dangerous but it's enough that it'll actually glow so it's a gas that glows it doesn't need to be charged by the sun or anything like that and the glow on that usually lasts about 10 to 20 years so because this comes in glass vials it does limit our abilities with what kind of ring designs we can do so we're gonna have to have a unique and completely different design for this one but I think it's still gonna look amazing I'm not hundred percent sure what we're gonna be going for but I'm probably gonna drop a few sketches show those off to you guys and we'll pick one of them to go with and we've got like a month before this is going to arrive so I've got plenty of time to think it over and figure it all out so I will check back in with you guys once that gets delivered wait a minute Dustin how did you get down here so fast did you fall through the ceiling again you sure did, you sly dog. Okay, but silly transitions aside, we do have the tritium. So I wanna show you guys what this looks like in the dark. So let's just follow me through here. We'll go to my dark, scary basement. So you can see here are the vials glowing in the dark. They're glass tubes, they're full of that tritium gas. 
These will make for a really interesting ring. I'm excited to start working with this. And I'm hoping this is a ring that I might be able to sell on my website. It's going to be really difficult and finicky to make, so we'll have to see how the production of it goes. But let me know what you think down in the comments if I should make these available. Alright, so our first step is going to be trimming down the outside of our piece of Damascus steel. It's not spinning perfectly centered in my lathe and so I just need to shave off just a little bit until we're cutting into all new material. That way it'll be perfectly centered and we can have a really even ring. Okay, and now I need to face off the outer surface of our cylinder here, and that's just to even it out. Before it was just a raw cut straight off a bandsaw. So just like on the outside, this gives us an even surface to work off of to make sure everything about this ring is perfectly even. Now I just quickly used a file to shave down the sharp edge here. It was really sharp. This definitely isn't necessary. It was just pretty sharp, so I didn't want to end up cutting myself on it. And then our next step, we need to start to drill a hole through the center of this. And so I'm going to start with a center drill here. That gets our hole started. And then I switch over to a drill bit because I'm doing a lot of drilling here. When I do just a simple ring blank, I usually just stick with the center drill. But in this case, since we're removing so much material and it's such a deep cut, I switch over to the drill bit. And then once we get the hole hollowed out enough that we can fit our boring bar in there, that's when we switch over to that. Because the boring bar, it's a lot faster, a lot more precise, and you don't have to keep changing it out every time you want to bump up a size. You just adjust the lathe and you can cut a bigger hole. So I just continue to hollow this out. I stop a little bit before the ring size we're going for because I do want to leave quite a bit of room for safety and I'll be able to trim this down later. So we're just trying to get a general hollowed out cylinder shape here. Then we'll be able to begin cutting the holes for the tritium vials. And once we're done with that, we can go back and then size it exactly how we want to. And now you'll see me use a combination of Sharpie and these calipers to put lines on the ring. The first line that I draw is to show the depth of the hole that I need to drill to get the tritium vials all the way through. And then the second one on the outer rim here, that's the line in which all of the holes that we're going to drill are going to be. And then the third thing you'll see me do here is I'm cutting this groove into the ring. That way when I'm drilling through the material, I'll be able to see it poke out the end and know when to stop. Now we're heading over to my mill and I first need to lay the whole thing out. And so I've marked a spot where I want to drill each of the holes. And then I use this center punch to put a little dent exactly where we want each of the holes. This is really helpful because when we're using drill bits that are this small, they're really flexible. And so if we didn't do any of these steps, the drill bit would just wander around everywhere and the hole would just be in a completely different spot. And it absolutely make the ring making process just undoable. We couldn't make this ring without this. So now that we've got those done, we're able to switch over to our drill bits on the mill. Then I've got the whole thing set up on a rotary table. So I drill one hole and then I'll rotate it 30 degrees and then I drill the next one and then we just continue that process until we've gone all the way around the ring. And throughout this whole process, I used about 10 drill bits. I ordered a pack of 15, and these are special cobalt drill bits, and they're also just a higher grade than most standard drill bits you'd get in a set. And that's very important because I definitely don't want one of these drill bits to snap off inside of the ring. It's a complete nightmare to deal with. And the reason I go through so many is because they can get dull pretty quickly, and I really, like I said, I don't want to take my chances getting these lodged in there. And so every time it goes dull and stops cutting as well as it was, I'll replace it for a new one. And this was totally worth it. I probably spent about $15 on drill bits for this ring, but we're putting hundreds of dollars of tritium in this, and so it's definitely worth it. This is also about $100 of Damascus steel. So this is an expensive ring, and I don't want to ruin it just because I'm cheap with my drill bits. Alright, so we now have every hole drilled and we're done with the mill. We're ready to switch back over to the lathe, but we first need to cut the ring off with the bandsaw. So once I've got the piece clamped into place, we're ready to start doing the actual cutting of it. 
and I turn on the machine and this Damascus steel, it's a really tough material so you gotta be careful with it. I'm going really easy on the saw here because I don't wanna dull the blade, but that can also have the opposite effect too. If you cut the material too slow, there'll be too much rubbing and it'll cause your blade to go dull. So you gotta be careful with that and get the right setting styled in. You'll see I add a little bit of oil just to add a little bit of lubrication. Now that we've got our chunk cut off, I'm ready to go over to the lathe and I just need to clean this up. That bandsaw left a really rough finish and so I'm just trimming it all away, getting it all cut to a new surface so that we can do some precision work on it. Now we've got that finished and you can see here there's a hole that didn't get drilled all the way through. So I went back and fixed that up. We were all fine from this point on. And then like I said earlier, I'm doing a final sizing to the inside of this ring. So I'm trimming it away very slowly, very carefully because I want a nice surface finish on here. Now it's time to start shaping the outside of the ring, and so I need to mount this on an expanding ring mandrel. And I wanted to show you guys a cool step you can do with your ring mandrels. These are available on my supplies website, and if you just have one of the sizes on hand and you need to cut a smaller ring that won't fit onto your mandrel, you can just trim it away a little bit. And this also has the added benefit of really truing up the mandrel in case there's any wobble to it, because as I'm sure a lot of you know, if you have something that expands like this, a lot of the times you can't get it to be perfectly true. And how true these spin depends on quite a few different factors, like how tight that you've got it. So if you're about to start work on a really important, very precise project, I do recommend just trimming it down just a little bit, taking away that layer, and that way you can get a really high accuracy of precision. So for this groove here, i am be switching between three different lathe cutters. I've got a left hand cutter that I start out with, and then a right hand cutter, and that's to get the edges exactly how we want them. And I wanna remove the bulk of the material with these because these are nicer cutters than this disposable one that I'm going to be using next. And the reason I'm using this is because it has a flat edge to it. So I'm able to get in there and flatten everything out, make sure it's all even. and I eventually get it all leveled out exactly how I want it. I had to switch between all the different cutters a couple of times, but now I've got it how I need it. I will need to do quite a bit of sanding to get the finish how I want it, but this is good for now. And next I need to do the bevels on the ring. And so the way I do this is I get my right hand cutter first and I touch it just barely on the edge of the ring. And once I get it there, I rotate the dial on the lathe 30 thousandths of an inch. And I generally like to do about 50 thousandths, but in this case, there wasn't enough room. We would have started to cut into the holes that we have drilled and so there just wasn't room for that. So in a future ring, I might leave a little bit more space there just so we can get a more defined bevel. But for now, this looks good. It gives it a nice sharp look to it. So I'm happy we could at least get something. Next, I use this power drill and I just have the same drill bit we used to drill the holes. The point of this step is just to clean everything up. We've got a lot of fragmented metal just hanging on there. And so between this and some sanding, I'll be able to clean up all the holes, make sure the ring is ready to have those tritium vials just slid right in. And then to improve the surface finish on the inside of the groove, you'll see I just use these very thin strips of sandpaper. And it's kind of a slow process because I don't have a lot of sandpaper to work with, but I eventually get it down to a surface finish that's definitely good enough for this. But I do eventually get it to a point where we've got a really nice surface finish. And then for the rest of the sanding on the ring, you'll see I'm using this metal block underneath my piece of sandpaper, and that's to keep the sandpaper flat. I don't want to smooth out any of these bevels. I wanna keep it looking really sharp, because like I said earlier, these bevels are pretty small, and just in general, it just gives you a nice cleaner look. So I very carefully sand the outer diameter as well as the bevels up to about 1500 grit, and that gets them perfectly smooth and they're ready to be polished. And then for the edges of the ring, I'm just sanding them on a flat piece of sandpaper on the table here, and there 
were a bunch of burrs around the holes here and so I started with some rough sandpaper. I spent a lot of time on that and then I just slowly polished everything up until I got it perfectly smoothed out and there were still a few little micro scratches in there but between the polishing and the etching we'll do we'll be able to completely get rid of those. So I'm polishing it up. This isn't completely necessary but it will give us some really nice etching results later on. So I did spend quite a bit of time. I started on the left with a white medium polish and then I switch over to the right and that's where I do the fine polish and that's how we're left with this mirror finish we've got here. Now it's time to go back into the lathe and this is where I'm going to add a comfort finish to the ring. And you can see I don't use electric tape to protect the outside of the ring. I usually do that on rings but because we're going to etch this in acid if I left any little marks on there they'd be completely hidden with the pattern that we put on it. And so between that and the polishing I do and it actually there was no marks visible after I polished it the second time and then once we etch it there's just no signs of that at all so that's why I'm not bothering with the electric tape. And then for the inside, polishing would be a lot trickier here. And so you'll see I'm using some specialty sandpaper. I do the standard 220 grit all the way up to 1000, but then I switch over to the second booklet of sandpaper I've got here. This goes from 1500 all the way up to 7000. And this is some special sandpaper. It's made in Germany and it's held to very high standards. So you can see we get a glossy finish just straight off the sandpaper. So this is awesome stuff. It's really cool to work with. Now we've got all the shaping done. This ring actually looks really cool the way it is, just super glossy and reflective. I put a lot of time getting this finish on here and you can see there are still some grooves in a few places and as I've stressed before, that's really not important. We're going to be etching this and that's going to completely hide any of those defects. Now for the etching, I'm pouring out half muriatic acid and then half hydrogen peroxide and then I'm carefully just dropping it down in there. I don't want to splash any, get it on my hands or my eyes or anything. So just carefully dropping it in there. And I let this etch for about five hours. And you can see in this time lapse that pattern, it just reveals itself and it's completely amazing. It just completely transforms the look of the ring. It went from a really shiny, just pure silver ring into a really rustic, almost wood grain looking texture that it has on it. And I really like the look it has. And now we have one final step to do to the finish of the ring to get it exactly how we want it. So I'm going back over to my ring mandrel and just mounting it on there. And then I'm going to sand the raised edges of the Damascus steel. And what this does is it gives us a polished glossy finish on the raised parts of the ring. And then on the lowered sections of it, it's got that really rough randomized texture that the acid gives it. So that just helps contrast the two different types of steel in the ring. We've got one that's polished and then the other one that's really rough. And this especially stands out in direct lighting where you can see the reflectiveness of the one material and then just how rough and matte the other one is. And you'll see once again, I put stiff materials underneath the sandpaper in order to not have it flex because I don't want to sand any of those lowered sections. So I need to be careful to sand strictly the raised portions. And now the step we've all been waiting for, this is the very last step and this is going to be gluing in the tritium vials. So I've worked about 20 hours on this ring to get up until this point, and we still haven't even touched the tritium. And that's kind of the whole point of the ring. So I waited for this for so long. And when I got to this step, I went and tried to test fit, and there was a lot of the holes where the tritium actually didn't finish. And so I spent at least an hour just hand finishing all those holes. I had to sand them out with some little files to try to widen up the holes and make sure everything fit. But I finally got all the holes to the exact size that we needed, and then we're ready to start gluing these in place. So I've just got some CA glue laid out here, and then this is just a blue stick of acrylic. This is just something I had handy that I could dab a little bit of the glue onto and then dab it into the groove on the ring. And it's important to be careful with this. Once I slide the piece of tritium in, I don't want to rotate it or anything because that'll bring up a lot of the glue with it. And that'll just completely mess up the nice finish that the glass has on it. So you'll just see me repeat this process over and over until I get these all done. I do a test fit just to make completely sure that the vial will fit in the hole. And then I add a little dab of glue there and then I slide it in exactly how I want it. I want to make sure it's flush on both edges and that the glass isn't sticking out on either end. And now we are totally finished with this ring and this felt so good to get done. It all came together so well and the end result just completely blew me away. This was a cool ring to see come together and it was so rewarding to see it all pay off. I was doing all these weird different steps on this ring and I had no idea if it would turn out how I wanted it. And there were a couple things that I would like to correct in a future version, but I'd say this for a prototype was exactly what I had envisioned and I couldn't be happier with it. 
So that's the ring guys. I've got a bunch of pictures that I'm going to be showing you right now of the ring that I took. It looks amazing in low lighting where those tritium vials really light up. And so I just took a whole bunch of photos. I wanted to show this off the best I could. So let me know what you think. I think this ring turned out really well. I do like the look that it has in the daytime. It's a really clean look. And then at night, this just comes to life. That green glow, it just goes everywhere. It's completely noticeable all the time. And what's great about the tritium is it doesn't need to be charged. So it'll glow like this all night long. And in some of these pictures, you can see it, even if I'm in a pitch black room, the tritium will light up the Damascus steel and it will cast shadows over the different textures of it. So it's just such an interesting ring to look at. I think this is definitely up there with my all time favorite ring I've ever made. But anyways, guys, I just want to thank you so much for watching this video. I put a lot of work into this ring. I, it literally was over the course of a couple months that we've been working on this ever since ordering the tritium. We had to wait for that to come from China. That in and of itself took over a month. And then once I had that, this was just such a daunting project that I just work on it whenever I had the free time and so I'd put in five hours here five hours there and it was just like once a week that I'd get around to it but I finally got this ring finished and so I really hope you appreciate this video if you did you can give it a thumbs up that really helps me out that lets YouTube know that this was a good video and that they'll recommend it to other people and if you're new to the channel you can subscribe I post two ring videos a week and I do all sorts of different rings I do a few other different projects here and there and you can of course always follow me on Instagram that's where I post a lot of my coupon codes I do a lot of giveaways there as well as just showing you guys kind of behind the scenes looks at what I'm doing. And as always, you can go to patrickadairdesigns.com. That's where I've got my rings for sale. And if you're interested in making the rings yourself, you can go to patrickadairsupplies.com as well. So thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. What's up my dudes? Today is finally the day that I will be releasing a video working with Timascus. So this is a material, it's one of those really exotic materials that I've always wanted to work with. I just never have had the opportunity to do so. And this week it's finally coming to pass. Uh, if you didn't see already, we made a video with the water jet channel. That's how we cut this blank out. And then I took it back to my shop and then I've cleaned it up here. If you haven't seen that video, go check it out. There's a link in the description. The reason I like the water jet video so much is because the Timascus sparks when it's cutting. So it looks really awesome on camera. And then I took it back to my shop. I just cleaned it up a little bit and then I heat anodized it just to give you guys a little preview of what it might look like at the end. The process of heat anodizing involves just getting a blowtorch and heating it up until you get the right colors you want. It can be really cool depending on how long you heat it up. You can get all sorts of amazing different colors. So it's a really fun, interesting material to work with. So the first step I'm going to take is I'm going to put it in my lathe jaws and then I'm going to use a center drill to go ahead and drill out the center of this thing. So there's actually two steps to the sizing process of the ring. First I need to use these center drills to hollow out the middle and that'll make it big enough that I can fit in my boring bar. And then once I've got that boring bar I can go ahead and just slowly trim the ring away until I've got it to the size I want. You'll see in the video my lathe stalls out a bunch of times as I'm trying to cut through this. That's because titanium is a really tricky material to work with, so it's a pain in the butt, but I think the results are definitely worth it. Now that we've got that hole hollowed out all the way through the blank, it's time to go ahead and switch to the boring bar. And this process is pretty straightforward. All I'm doing is using that boring bar and slowly trimming away the inside of the ring. I'm making sure to measure periodically as I'm doing this to make sure I don't oversize the ring.
And now that we've got that finished, I'll just show you a preview of what we've done so far. So I've got the inside sized correctly, but the outside is a little bit too big, so we need to go ahead and trim that down. You can see as I cut it away that the coloring on the ring gets removed. But at the end of the video, you'll see me using a blowtorch and we get a really awesome color out of it. And I'm going to show you plenty of videos and photos of it. So stick around till the end to see that. Okay, next I need to make this ring comfortable to wear. So I'm going to be using an angled lathe bit. And then I'm just going in and putting this slight little bevel on this edge here. And that's to get rid of that sharp edge. If I were to put that on my finger right now, it would literally be painful to put on. And so just breaking that edge helps a lot. But then I'm going to go ahead and use this Dremel and I'm going to continue to round that out just a little bit more and that makes it a lot more comfortable as well. I'm finished with the first side, now I just need to flip it over, repeat the same thing again. And then to finish it up, I'm just going to take a few different grits of sandpaper and polish the inside of this. Now we're ready to trim down the outside diameter of the ring and then shape the profile. I'm going to do a beveled look on this ring. I think that'll be really cool. It'll show off all the different swirls of the Timascus a little bit better than just a flat profile would. And you can see I'm just taking my time. I'm taking really small bites out of the Timascus every time I pass over it. And again, it's just because the Timascus is so tricky to work with. Now that we've got the outside diameter how we want it, it's time to go ahead and add the bevels. And to do this, it's actually pretty simple. All I'm doing is grabbing a left hand lathe bit to do the left side of the ring and I'm going to grab a right hand lathe bit to do the right side. So I'm just taking that angled part and pushing it against the side of the ring, slowly trimming it down. And you can see I get to a certain point and the bevel is actually too wide for the lathe bit to be able to handle all at once. And then I just do it step by step until I get it all flush and I get that nice bevel. Okay, and with that, we've got the shaping of this ring completely finished. In this close-up shot, you can see the different patterns it has in there. And if you don't know what Timascus is, it's layered different pieces of titanium that are put together. The process of making it is actually patented by Alpha Knife Supply, and they're really secretive about how they do it. So I'm not completely sure how it's made. They keep that top secret. And one thing to note, I didn't see a single delamination or any issue with the material, which I'm sure is very hard to do. So quality control is definitely really good there. I just want to give a shout out to Alpha Knife Supply. They didn't sponsor this video, but I did buy this material from them. So you can see a link down in the description where I bought that if you want to buy some yourself. Okay, now comes the best part, the part I've been waiting for, the part that I'm sure you've all been waiting for, and that's the heat anodizing. So this process is fairly simple. All I'm doing is taking this blowtorch and heating up the ring, but it can be kind of tricky to get the colors you want. So what you're seeing here is actually like my third attempt doing this. I didn't get the colors I wanted the first two times, so I took it back and sanded away the anodization, but I finally got it right in this take. It's important to apply even heat all the way around it. So that's why you'll see me rotating the ring around. And the colors I'm going for is that really deep purple, as well as getting some of that blue, but I still wanna maintain some of that golden color. So if you do it too long, the golden colors start going away, as well as the colors start getting a bit washed out. But there can be some pros to that. The colors have some different properties depending on how hot you get the ring. 
So it's definitely really fun to experiment with, but this is totally my favorite way to do it. Oh, and by the way, if you didn't know, I've got a website. It's just patrickadairdesigns.com. That's where I sell rings. I'll actually be selling some Timascus rings. I've got enough material to make like three to four more. So if you're looking for a really special ring made out of Timascus, one of the most exotic materials there is, then go ahead and check out my website. I also do a bunch of other stuff like superconductor and meteorite rings. And then also be sure to keep an eye on my Instagram. That's where I'm going to be posting a huge discount code for Black Friday and Cyber Monday. So if you want to buy one of these things, head over to my Instagram, follow me on there. It's at Patrick Adair Designs, or you can follow the link in the description. And you're going to want to get in on that Black Friday discount code. All right, so I'm getting pretty close to the color I want here on the anodizing. I'm just gonna hit it here for a few more seconds and then we'll be done. All right, that's the heat anodizing done. I'm gonna dump a bunch of water on it. This thing is super hot right now. And with that, the ring is completely finished. So let me know what you think in the comments, guys. I think this is one of the coolest rings I've ever seen. Hey everyone, welcome back to Patty Cakes Bakes, YouTube's favorite cooking channel. I'm your host, Patty Cakes, and today we're gonna to be whipping up a fresh batch of rusty copper. And I know what it sounds like. It sounds like it's gonna be a terrible recipe, a not very tasty dish, and that's because you're right. Today we're gonna to switch things up. We're not cooking a casserole or anything like that. We're gonna be making a ring, in fact. And so we're gonna be taking this copper. I'm gonna go for kind of like a shipwrecked look to it. We just wanna make it look like it's a really old, ancient piece. And then we're gonna be using ammonia and salt in this vapor chamber, which is just a Tupperware dish. And then I'm gonna be setting it in there and that will allow the vapors to accumulate. And then after about 24 hours, we're gonna pull this out and it's gonna be completely patina. These are gonna cause a chemical reaction, which essentially just speeds up the oxidation that naturally occurs in materials like copper. And we're going to come back and I have no idea what it's going to turn out like. I've never even done a forced patina before. I've just kind of looked it up online. But we're going to make a ring out of this, like I said, do that patina. I think we should end up with some really cool and very interesting looking results. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so step one, I need to cut off a piece of copper. And you can see I'm doing it a lot longer than I normally do. I normally just do a width big enough to make a ring out of it. And the reason I'm doing it so long is because that'll give us kind of a handle to hold on to later. And this will be when I'm using a hammer to give it kind of a messed up rough finish. Now I'll be cutting the piece on the lathe. And what I'm doing here is just cutting the outer diameter into the ring and then trimming up the edge so it's perfectly flat. And in a few moments, you'll notice that I carve away a lot of the copper to the left side of the ring, and that's to give me space to get the head of the hammer in later, and that way I can put the hammered finish all over the entire surface of the ring, not just the top side. I wanna get those edges just a little bit. So now we've got the outer shaped finish. You can see this is super hot at this point. Copper is very conductive and so it just picked up a lot of the heat from the lathe. So you're seeing I'm using this paper towel here. And one thing to also take note of, I put bevels on this. And the reason I did this is because the surface of the copper can kind of mushroom over if that makes sense. So when I hit it with a hammer, I don't want those edges to mushroom over on the edges. So I put a little bevel there and that completely avoids that issue. And my hammering technique is very straightforward, very basic. I just have a ball peen hammer. This is important because it can get a lot of cool details in there and each hammer strike it's a lot easier to get a dent on there so if you're trying this yourself definitely be sure to use a ball peen hammer and i'm just completely covering the entire outer surface of the ring with the hammer strikes now i'm switching back over to the lathe and i'll be using the live center here to get a hole started and then i'll switch over to some drill bits if you didn't know copper can be very tricky to machine it work hardens and so it becomes hard and gummy and sticky it's just kind of a nightmare to work with so you might notice i take a few extra steps than i regularly do to do some of the things like hollowing out the inside of the ring and then now that i've got the hole started i just use this lathe boring bar and i just widen it up until i get to that final inner ring diameter that i want
So at this point, I've almost got the final shape of our ring finished. I do need to do a few last second touch-ups though, so I'm putting it in the lathe and I'm trimming it just a little bit with the boring bar. And then you'll see me go in with the Dremel here and I'm rounding off those edges. I wanna make sure this is really smooth and very comfortable to wear. And then after I round those edges with the rough Dremel, that's when I go in with the sandpaper and I really smooth it out, make sure it's nice, perfectly smooth and very comfortable. I don't go as far as to put a really high polish on this because that's gonna be completely ruined by the oxidizing we do. So all I'm doing is just making sure it's nice and smooth, but not necessarily super shiny. So we just got our ring finished. I think it turned out really well. I'm surprised with the results that we were able to get. Um, but I just put that hammered finish on there that you can see. And then the inside, I just left that smooth. And one thing I want to experiment with, but I'm not doing in this video, is you can put like a clear nail polish or any other type of coating on the inside. And that will protect the inside from getting oxidized. Um, but then the outside, that'll still get the blue finish that we're going for. But I don't want to do that for this video. I want this ring to genuinely look like it's been sitting at the bottom of the ocean for a hundred years and we just pulled it out and that's what we're going to go for. And I'm probably going to protect it with a clear coat of some sort. That way it's not getting on your finger and it doesn't just flake off over time. And so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, like I said earlier, we've got our little Tupperware here. I've got two paper towels folded down at the bottom here that will absorb the ammonia and then ammonia, it just vaporizes really easy. So there's going to be a lot of vapor coming off of that so we need to put the lid on and there's just going to be a ton of ammonia in the air and between that and having salt on the ring it will cause the ring to oxidize and do it very quickly and so I'm going to go ahead and do that I just need to pour a good amount of ammonia in here soak the paper towel if you've ever smelled ammonia it is so strong and it's just because it vaporizes so fast oh my gosh that's crazy so yeah you see like boxers they use it I, I think I don't know if that's just like a story or if I just watched Rocky or something and I think I'm no stuff but it's so strong that it like wake you up if you're knocked out anyways we've got our ammonia in there that is definitely working and then I've got this little folded up tin foil piece here the reason I'm using this is because it'll provide a surface for the ring to rest on that's very, um, I need to put a lid on this, that is so strong. That's very small, so it's gonna have a very small surface contact with it because I don't want the, uh, whatever the ring is touching to affect it. And I also don't want it to be sitting in the liquid ammonia itself. So that'll just rest on there nicely. We've got our salt. Um, it's not just gonna to stick to the ring, so I think I need to get it a little bit wet with the ammonia spread that around oh my gosh I'm like I'm tearing up over here and not because it's such a beautiful sight also because it's a beautiful sight all my hard work finally seeing the fruits of my labor but that ammonia is ridiculously strong okay so we have this coated in a ton of salt here and I, I wanna make sure it's staying on well. Yeah, it looks like it is. We don't have salt everywhere and that's a good thing. Um, I, I wanna have a natural looking uh, finish on it, all said and done. And then also the, it, the oxidation will spread. And so we're not just gonna see a little uh, circle of blue where every salt piece is. We should see a nice general oxidation. Okay, I think that is perfect, exactly how we want it. So I'm gonna put the lid on here. We need to wait. Um, I haven't done this before, so I don't know the exact time that we're going to wanna to do, but I'll just keep checking on it. Probably gonna be about 24 hours. At that time, I'll take it out. I will uh, stop it from oxidizing when I've got it where I want it. And then we'll check back in with you in a couple of days. All right, so I actually ended up doing a bunch of different experimenting with the finish on this. It was kind of tricky to get it just how I wanted, so I ended up scraping off the finish and starting over a few times, but eventually I was able to get it down to a process that I liked and to get a finish that I thought was really cool. 
So that's what you see here. I thought this finish just looked amazing. It just looks so old and ancient. And I thought one just perfect final touch would be to take some really high grit sandpaper. I've got 1500 grit right here. And then just take that and sand those edges. And so that just makes that copper pop and just makes it so much more contrasty. And I think it just really adds to the overall look of the ring. And then like I said earlier, I put on a really good layer of this lacquer I've got here. And this is specially formulated for materials like copper or brass, so it'll stick to it really well. And then I put a lot of very, very thin layers on here. So I did a light misting. I'd wait a few minutes for it to dry, rotate the ring, repeat the process again. And that way we just have a very consistent, very nice and natural looking finish on here. So that's the ring guys. I just love the way this turned out and I'm so excited to share these photos with you guys. I just think it turned out amazing. I cannot tell you how long I've been waiting to do an oxidized finish on copper like this. And there's no real reason I haven't done it. I just haven't really got around to it. And this literally, I've been wanting to do this since before I even made rings. So this is something that I've wanted to do for probably five years now. So this was so cool to be able to do and to be able to get results that just blew me away. So that's the ring guys. I think this is exactly what I was going for. It looks like it was genuinely a shipwrecked ring. You can see these photos we took with the sand and the water to make it look like a beach effect. It just looks like it's just straight out of the ocean. It just washed up one day. And I can't tell you guys how satisfying it is to be able to picture a ring design in your head and to be able to go through all that whole process. And maybe at the end, you're not left with exactly what you had envisioned but you still think it's every bit as cool as what you had imagined. And going into making this ring, I didn't think this is one that I would put for sale. This is a ring that takes a whole lot of work to do, a lot of man hours, but it's made out of copper, which isn't super valuable. So that kind of doesn't blend well all the time. But based on the reactions that I've had from everyone who's seen this ring, everyone has just completely- Me, me, review, me, review, me, review, view, me, 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 review. Hey, how's it going, bros? My name is Gloria Borga, and as most of you probably know, the holy war between T-Series and PewDiePie has never been as hot as it is now, and if anyone needs our help right now more than anyone, it's PewDiePie, and so I thought I would do my part, and today we're going to make a ring that is styled after his red and black kind of PewDie swirl logo thingy that he does, and we're going to integrate an NFC chip into it that'll subscribe you to PewDiePie and unsubscribe you from T-Series. So the whole goal here is just to streamline the process, when you're doing the Lord's work, when you're out there fighting the good fight, you can just walk up to someone's phone, tap your ring to it, it'll unsubscribe them from T-Series, subscribe them to PewDiePie, should be fantastic. And now the ring itself, I'm going to be making it out of micarta. If you don't know what that is, essentially you just take fabric, this is black fabric, this is red fabric, and you mix it in with resin. So I've got a bunch of resin here, and the way we're going to do it, I'm trying to get the PewDiePie swirl logo. Uh, effect and so I think the best way to go about it I've got two different methods I'm going to try one in the PVC pipe and then one in this mold and essentially I'm just going to take both of these wad them up and I'm going to obviously use a lot more fabric than this but I'll wad it all up I'll try to get it swirled together so that they uh, blend nicely and look a lot like the logo and then I will cover it in this plate and you can see it's perforated. We'll add resin to it. It'll infiltrate and soak into the fabric. And then we'll just crush it down so it's compact. There's no air bubbles. And then once it hardens, we should be able to pull out a slab of our micarta fabric. And once we cut into it, the goal is that it will resemble PewDiePie's uh, swirl logo. And then the same thing goes for the PVC pipe method. It's just gonna be, I'm gonna try two different methods and see which gives us the best looking patterns. So I'll just take our fabric, stuff it in here. I'll use the, this piece of metal to cram it in there. And then for both of them, I'll just use clamps to clamp the whole thing, compact it all, get rid of all the air bubbles, make sure that there's no clear spots in it. And for both of the molds, I'll be using a clamp on this one, put the fabric in, put the plate on top, clamp it shut. That way we'll get rid of all of the air bubbles and there won't be any resin patches or anything like that. And then same thing goes for this one. I might have to trim this pipe down a little bit, but basically I'll just clamp this on one end and then just screw this down tight. So we should end up with a pretty nice looking ring. I was wondering about integrating glow powder into it, but I think I'll keep it simple for this video. Uh, we'll make the ring, hopefully it resembles his logo as much as possible, and then we'll add the NFC chip in. It'll be hidden so you won't even be able to notice it. And uh, we'll just spread that good word, like I said. So let's go ahead and get started. 
So for my first step, I obviously need to cut up the fabric. So I'm doing that now, just cutting it into strips. I've got the black fabric and then the red, and then I'm doing a mock fit in the mold. I wanna see how it's all going to fit together. And I wanted to kind of strategize how I was going to get the fabric to look swirled once I cut into it. And so you can see, I just roll the two together. And then every couple of layers, I throw a layer of the red and then the black on over the whole thing. And then just repeat, I'm just trying to get something that will give me kind of a crazy swirled pattern. And so there's, there's not a lot of science to it, just a lot of experimentation. And one thing that I didn't show it on camera because I didn't want to bore you guys, but I actually spent a week trying to perfect the pattern and figure out the best way to crumple the fabric in order to get it to closely resemble that logo. So the material I use is actually a couple of iterations past what you see me making in the video, but the concepts are all the same. I just take this resin and the first thing I need to do it after I mix in the catalyst, the catalyst is what makes it harden. Um, I take it and I put it in my vacuum chamber and that gets rid of any of the bubbles that are within the resin itself and then after that I'm able to completely soak all of the fabric in that resin and then I put it in the mold and the reason I'm doing the all the vacuum chamber stuff is because I'm trying to remove as many bubbles as possible it might not be obvious but if you've ever tried making my card up before bubbles are like your worst enemy it's really difficult to get them out and they just get in places where you'd never even imagine and so that's why you need to use so much pressure that's why you need to use the vacuum chamber all of that is to get rid of any of those bubbles because because that can totally ruin your ring or anything else you're trying to make out of micarta. So now I have the resin and the fabric combined inside the PVC pipe and then I'm taking this clamp here and I'm compressing the whole thing. And what this is doing is it's compressing all of that fabric and it's squeezing out any of the excess resin. Like I said, we only want the resin in there to hold everything together. We don't actually want clear spots in our final product. That's going to make sure that the final product is as close as possible to a solid block of fabric with a minimal amount of resin. Now I'm going to repeat all of those steps, but this time with the square shaped mold. So I degas the resin in the vacuum chamber, then I soak the fabric in it, I place it in the mold, and then I put that perforated top on top of it, obviously, and then I screw on all of these clamps and I just compress it as hard as I can. And you can see just how much resin it removes from it. There's just a ton at the top that I can then pour in a waste cup. And again, it's just because we're trying to get rid of as much resin as possible. And for the final step, you guessed it, we're throwing it into the vacuum chamber for a second time. and. Uh, it's gonna be for the same exact reason again. We're just trying to get rid of every single bubble that we can because we don't want any of them. Now it's time to demold the pieces and then I'll cut into them with a saw and I'll get a nice preview of what the pattern's going to look like. And this is honestly one of the funnest parts of the project. It's pretty early in, but you get a really good look of that pattern that you've worked so hard to try to get. So obviously I pry all of the micarta out of the mold and then I switch over to the miter saw. And this is when I cut some of the chunks up and I can get a really nice preview of what the cross section will look like. And you can see we did get some really nice swirls in it and I was actually impressed with the way the first attempt turned out but I think you'll agree what I end up using is actually a much better material it was like I said earlier a couple of iterations after this first one and I was able to get a much tighter swirl to it and, that, and that's really important for a ring where it's so small that way we still get a lot of the pattern showing up even though it's in such a small space. So now I've got the material made for our ring, it's time to get onto the actual ring making itself. So I'm starting out on my drill press here, I've got a hole saw fit into it, and I'm cutting out the inner diameter for the ring, and then I use a larger hole saw to cut out the outer diameter. Now we have a really good preview of what the pattern is going to look like. And you can see for yourself, the pattern turned out really nicely. I think it genuinely matches PewDiePie's red and black swirl pretty closely. Now I'm going to cut out a piece of this material I've got here. You can see it's got carbon fiber on the top and the bottom. And then in the middle, it's this red fiberglass color and it's infused with this glow powder. So it's a really interesting looking material. And if you're wondering what the heck it's for, um, sorry to just throw it in on you. I thought it would be good to conceal the NFC chip that we put on it and not just glue it in there. I think it would look a little bit clunky. And so you'll see the way I integrate it. I'm going to use the red part of the material for the inside of the ring that'll match the ring I think pretty well and then I'll be able to cut a little trough in it and that I can place the NFC chip in and that'll completely conceal the NFC chip in the ring that way an unsuspecting T-Series subscriber won't even get suspicious when you approach them with the ring. And if at this point you're a little bit confused as to how all of the pieces are going to fit together, just watch the video. I could explain it, but it really is self-explanatory. You'll see how I machine both of the pieces to fit together, and then I machine a little groove into the fiberglass 
section of the ring, and that's to fit the NFC chip into. So now I have the groove cut into the inner fiberglass piece, and it was fairly simple. The NFC chip itself is only about a half a millimeter thick, so it was just a shallow little groove, and then I was able to glue it in place, and the chip itself is flexible, so very straightforward. I just glue it in place, and then any of the excess glue on there, I was able to trim that down to get the whole thing flush again, and then I glued both of the pieces together, so I glued the inner fiberglass to the outer PewDiePie patterned piece. So now I've got everything put together. We really are in the home stretch now. So I just need to, at this point, trim everything down, do some sanding and polishing, as well as just some finishing touches to it. But then this thing will be finished and I'm really excited to show you how it works. We put a lot of work into the actual programming of it. We had to figure out a couple of clever tricks to figure out how to get it to redirect twice, but we got it to work. And I think you'll really like what we were able to get this thing to do. So make sure to stick around for the end. So here's the ring guys, and I'm honestly really happy with the way that the pattern turned out. From the beginning with this project, this was the thing that I was most concerned about because if you think about it, I'm starting with a bunch of fabric that I have to cover in resin and then smash into a mold. And then after that, I have to cut a ring shape out of it, sand it and polish it, and have it resemble PewDiePie's swirl pattern. And that's just so many steps to get right. And in the end, I think it does look really nice. So I'm really happy with the way that turned out. And then the inside, the fact that it glows, I think that's cool as well. So you can see under this UV light especially, it just really brings out that color. And so overall, it's a really fun and interesting looking ring that I genuinely like the look of. And then I just thought the hidden functionality of it was so funny. We were able to program it so that when you tap it to your phone, it'll take you to T-Series homepage on YouTube and prompt an unsubscribe. And then you can obviously confirm that. And then shortly thereafter, it'll redirect you to PewDiePie where you can subscribe. So I just thought that was so clever and just the perfect functionality for the PewDiePie ring. But if you thought the video was over, you are sorely mistaken. I've got one more secret announcement, and it's that we're doing a charity raffle for this ring. And I thought this would be a perfect fit for it. What we're going to do, we'll have a raffle for it. There's going to be a link in the description that will explain everything more in detail. But we're going to be donating 100% of the proceeds to charity. So this is just something I wanted to do because it's a great cause. But more importantly, I think, is because I wanted to integrate the number 399 into this video. I think it's important to make that distinction and to set our priorities straight. So, of course, you can get one entry for 99 cents, but if you want to get five entries, it's just $3.99.
This project started with a question. What could I create if I had no limits? A ring where nothing was off the table, no budget and no time constraint. Made with the best materials sourced from every corner of this universe, I wanted to create a ring that contained as much history in it as an entire museum while being durable enough to last a lifetime. So today, that's what I'll be making. The ring core will be made from grade five titanium. It'll then be inlaid with an incredible variety of materials, including meteorite, megalodon tooth, several varieties of natural opal, Tyrannosaurus rex teeth, and strontium illuminate glow crystals. First, I'll machine the ring core using my lathe. I'll face off a flat end surface and trim the outer diameter to size. Then I'll hollow out the center using a drill bit. Now I'm using a boring bar to widen the diameter until it's just under my desired ring size. Now it's time to cut the inlay channel into the ring blank. I have measured and marked out my desired dimensions. Now I'll carefully cut out the channel until it reaches one and a half millimeters in depth. Now as a finishing touch, I will use an aggressively angled carbide lathe bit to carve an undercut into the sidewalls of the inlay channel. This will geometrically anchor the inlay in place, making it virtually impossible to ever come loose. Now the core will be separated from the rest of the titanium using my cutoff tool. Now to get started on the inlay, I need to prep a few materials. First, I'll separate a piece of Australian and Amuka matrix opal. This is a mineral that is embedded with thousands of tiny opals that give off an amazing rainbow of colors. Now I'll crush it, removing some of the best larger pieces to be used later. Then I'll crush it further until it's the texture of sand. I'll be mixing the small pieces with aqua strontium illuminate glow crystals and black mica pigment in order to create a mixture that I can use for the first layer of the inlay, giving the rest of the inlay pieces an incredible looking backdrop to be displayed on.
I'll use my medium viscosity Astrotech CA adhesive to apply the opal and glow mixture to the titanium. Then I'll use super thin viscosity to absorb into any remaining dry spots. Now we can move on to the larger inlay pieces. And before I begin crushing and inlaying the pieces, I want to note that I have collected both excellent and poor condition fossils and materials for this ring. I use the excellent condition pieces to get amazing pictures and footage. Then I will be using the otherwise unappreciated fossils and materials to cut up and create these stunning rings. This will allow the materials to be appreciated much more than they otherwise would have been. The first of the larger inlay pieces will be those larger Australian and Amuka matrix opal pieces I set aside earlier. And you'll notice I'm inlaying this entire ring under a microscope. That way I can get every single piece exactly where I want it and in a way that it will be securely anchored and never have a risk of falling out. Ethiopian Wello Opal is the next material. I crush the larger pieces down to a variety of sizes that I'll pepper the inlay channel with. Depending on the angle at which you view the pieces, you'll see an incredible range of colors flash at you. So by inlaying the pieces into a round ring, this ensures that no matter what angle you view it from, you will always see an amazing variety of colors coming from the opal. This next material I am very excited for, this is an actual Tyrannosaurus Rex tooth. Now I want to preserve the teeth serrations to make them visible in the finished ring, so I'll very carefully crush and separate out the best pieces. Just seeing and working with this material was such an incredible experience. The tooth came from what was once an actual living and breathing dinosaur. This is one of the most amazing creatures to have ever existed, and it's a real artifact from over 65 million years ago when the T-Rex roamed this earth. This is going to make for an incredible addition to this ring. Now it's time for the Megalodon tooth, and I'll be using this beautiful example, and just like the T-Rex tooth, the enamel is still intact, but this time around, there's contrasting colors between the two parts of the tooth, which presents us with a great opportunity to display uh, that unique trait in this ring. Megalodons are the largest water-dwelling predator to have ever existed, and a fact that blows my mind is that it's estimated that a megalodon had to eat over 2,000 pounds of food every single day just to maintain its body weight. The megalodon grew to be up to 60 to 70 feet long, making it about three times larger than even the largest great white sharks existing today. 
and this six inch tooth is just one of several hundred teeth that the average megalodon had. Also, compared to the T-Rex, this is actually a fairly recent animal to have existed, with fossils dating back to as little as two and a half million years ago, and the oldest known fossils coming from about 25 million years ago. Now fragments of Campo del Cielo meteorite will be added. This hurled through space for eons before it fell into what is present-day Argentina. And it was four to five thousand years ago that the Campo del Cielo meteorite exploded through our atmosphere and it left several large craters as well as millions of smaller fragments that settled around that area. The material composition is roughly 93% iron, 6% nickel, 0.5% copper, and 0.5% other trace elements. The natural shape of the pieces is amazing and it will greatly enhance the beauty of this ring overall. Finally, I'll be adding a few Muaniana Lusta meteorite shavings to go with the Campo del Cielo. The curled pieces will give the ring a lot of interesting metallic reflections. Now this meteorite fell in present day Scandinavia and that was about 1 million years ago. And larger pieces of Muaniana Lusta like this one here that I used to make my solid rings out of have this amazing pattern of nickel iron crystals on them but what's even cooler about them is the story that they tell. Now in order to form the crystal patterns, the meteorite needed to be molten and cool to a solid very slowly over the course of several million years. Because of how slow this process is, this process can't be replicated in a laboratory or anywhere else on Earth. That gives this such a unique and amazing trait to it. And there's a lot you can deduce based on the fact that this had to cool so slowly. So what that means is that the molten meteorite was floating through the universe for literally millions of years before it crash landed on Earth. The history these pieces have is incredible and it feels so cool to wear them on your finger every single day. Now as a final touch, I'll dust in a bit more strontium aluminate glow crystals. This will give it a more powerful glow at night because it isn't mixed with the opal and pigment like it was earlier. The way these crystals work is they absorb UV light and then they release it slowly as visible light that has an aqua colored wavelength. So the way this works in practice is just wearing your ring in sunlight or even indoor light will charge it and it'll give off an amazing glow every night and it lasts for hours. Now that's it for the inlay pieces. What an incredible collection of materials and the way they all look together is just stunning. But now before I add a protective finish to everything, I'll go ahead and finish the inside of the ring. I'll sand it to its exact size and shape it to give it a comfort finish. carefully give it a brushed finish which will allow it to effectively hide any scratches as well as give it a premium look. Now it's time to add the protective coating. To do this I have a special UV hardening resin that is crystal clear, highly scratch resistant, and it's never going to yellow with time. While the lathe is on, I'll apply it to the ring and I'll use this metal spatula to carefully get the resin in place and shape the surface of it to give the ring a consistent domed profile. And then with this high powered UV light, I'll harden the resin.
here's the ring finished. Such a beautiful piece of jewelry. I love the way this looks in the light. And when viewed in darkness, the glow effect. Hello my dudes and welcome back to my channel. I've got a little bit of a different video for you today so I hope you'll enjoy it. I'm working on a complex custom ring and it's a little more technical than most of the rings I make and it involves the use of a mill which I've never used in a video before. And so for these reasons I'm going to split this project into two videos. This will let me show you exactly how I progress and it'll also give you a look into some of the decision making that I have when I'm making a new type of ring for the first time. I've also got some new equipment in the mail that I'm going to need to finish up this ring, like some new end mills as well as a new ring mandrel. So I wanted to share this video with you guys and make sure I got a video uploaded this Wednesday. So let me know what you think of the new video down in the comments. So as you probably guessed by the title of this video, I'll be making a Green Lantern ring and it's going to be made out of a solid piece of meteorite. So I had to find a massive chunk of meteorite for this and then I had to get a custom ring blank cut out by a water jet. So you can see I've got this squared off ring shape cut into this slab of meteorite. And then you can see I'm comparing it here to this other Green Lantern ring I have. This was actually sent to me by the customer so I'd have something to pattern it after. He's a really cool guy and he's a big fan of Green Lantern. So we're going to do attempt to make just one of the coolest Green Lantern rings ever. Now I'm going to draw some basic angles on the square edges of the ring blank and then I'll use the belt sander to sand it down. Once we've got that done, I'm going to go ahead and clean the inside of it up. So I'll use a Dremel to get rid of any of the big initial sharp edges. and then I'll finish smoothing it out here on the lathe. Now one thing to note is that I'm stopping about a millimeter or two short of the final ring diameter, and that's just gonna give me a little wiggle room for if I have any errors. Now the last thing I'm going to do for this first video will be squaring up the face of the ring using the mill. This will leave us with a nice even ring blank that I can carefully lay out so that all I'll have left to do is to remove a bit more of material from the ring and then give it its classic green lantern shaping and styling. And I'm going to use the mill for most of that. I might end up having to do a little bit of hand filing, but you'll see how I get that figured out in the second video. So 
So at this point, we're left with a nice ring blank. We've got a lot of the general shaping done. So I'm able to imagine a little better exactly how I'm gonna go about finishing all the shaping we'll need to do for it. I usually find that a really important step when starting a new project like this is that you wanna spend a lot of time planning on exactly how you're gonna go about doing it. So now that we've got this nice ring blank ready to go, it's gonna be a little less of a daunting task to figure out exactly how I wanna go about shaping the rest of this ring. So that's going to be it for this video. Stay tuned for part two, which I will hopefully be posting a week from today, just depending on how long it takes me to finish this. If you've got any suggestions or feedback for me, please leave those down in the comments. I'll read them all, and it might actually help me in finishing up this ring. Hey, what's up my dudes? I've got a very special video for you today. This is going to be part two of the Meteorite Green Lantern Ring video I posted earlier. And this was a huge project and I'm so excited to be able to share it with you in this video. In total, I spent probably over 70 hours making this thing, but I'd say the result is definitely worth it. If you missed part one, I'll show you a really quick recap of it now, but you can also watch the entire video by clicking the link in the description. So I started out with this meteorite slab and I had a ring blank cut out of it by the water jet channel. And then I sanded the bevels on it and hollowed out the inside of it. The next thing I did was flatten the face of the ring so I'd have a nice surface to use for laying out some of the design features with Sharpie. And that was so I could come up with the best plan of attack for all the steps that I'll be taking in this video, which is part two. All right, so the first step we'll be taking in this video will be to level out both sides of the ring and they need to be parallel so that I can perfectly clamp the ring in my mill vise later on. I'm using a left and right handed lathe cutter to level out each side. You'll notice that I don't flatten the entire side of the ring and that's okay, I only need to do a fairly small section of it in order to get a good clamp on the ring. Now I'm going to keep the ring on its mandrel as it is perfectly centered and then I'm going to mount it on my mill's rotary table. I'll be using this quarter inch end mill to flatten the three faces of the ring and then I'll round out the back half of it. All of these steps you'll see me do by the way are done by rotating the cross feed handles or rotating the rotary table's dials and I'm doing that all just with my hands. So now the ring has its basic shapes, but the angles on the faces are totally off. So I'm copying the left face's angle by cutting along this sticker with a razor. Then I flipped it over to its sticky side, and now I've got a perfect copy of the other angle to trace so that I know that both sides are perfectly even. Next I need to cut out a Green Lantern logo template from this sticker sheet. 
I just printed a big range of sizes and then I picked one that was the best fit for the ring. Now I'm going in and very carefully tracing the logo by hand using this mini end mill. I'm doing my best here to evenly follow the lines on the template. Now that that's done, I want to extend the cuts into the logos just so the circle has a bit more definition. And to do that, I'm using a diamond coated cutoff wheel. I picked this cutoff wheel because it's much thinner than most other cutoff wheels that you'd use in a Dremel. This is a step that could ruin the entire ring with one slip of my hand. After using the cutoff wheel, I did a couple of touch-ups off camera. I was using a cone-shaped bit for that, and that just evened out some of the harsh cuts left by the cutoff wheel. All right, this next step will be a bit tricky, but it will add a really nice look to the ring. So I'll be adding angled grooves to the sides of the rings, and to make the cuts, I'll need to rotate my mill vise to match the angle I drew the lines at. And I need to rotate it each time so I can match each of the angled lines on there. And again, I'm using these miniature end mills for it. These are pretty fragile. I actually broke about six of these on this step, but I was eventually able to cut through all of those grooves. And now I'm just using a diamond file to smooth out some of the edges. And that'll make the transitions of the grooves to the other shapes on the ring just a little more graceful. Then I'll use a drill bit to carefully cut a hole out for the emerald I'll be mounting in the ring. This step isn't too difficult, but I did have to use a few different shaped drill bits to make the hole perfectly fit the emerald. And for the final shaping step, I'll be using my belt sander at an angle 
in order to sand a taper into the ring and this will make it a lot more comfortable to wear. Several times throughout this step, I stopped and measured my progress and that was really helpful. It helped me keep things even and then made sure I didn't go too far with any of the sanding. And then off camera, after using the belt sander, I actually used a Dremel and I did a little bit of fine tuning with that and then I used a few different grits of sandpaper on the Dremel and that put a nice smooth finish on the whole ring. And with that, all of the shaping for this ring is finally done and we're ready to etch. So for etching, I'm using one part muriatic acid and then one part hydrogen peroxide. I made sure to flip the ring every 10 to 20 minutes and I let it etch for about an hour in total. Now it was at this point when I was taking it out of the acid, I just had to stop and look at it for like five minutes. Up until now, the ring didn't look that great. And after pulling it out of the acid, you can really start to see how this is gonna be such an amazing looking ring. That etch just completely transformed this somewhat bland looking ring into a, just an incredible and really interesting looking ring. Now after very thoroughly drying the ring, I'm applying Protect-A-Clear to it. I did four or five coats and I covered every single surface of the ring. This will help protect the ring from oxidizing and other damage. And the final step I actually did off camera. All I did was place a dab of E6000 adhesive in the gem hole and then I pressed the emerald in making sure it was even all sides. Now the ring is done. I seriously can't tell you guys how good it feels to get this thing finished. It turned out even better than I had hoped, and I made it through the whole process without any major mistakes. And that was a really stressful part about this because this was my first time attempting a lot of the steps required to make this ring. I actually bought the mill specifically for this ring. Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. We've got a new design for you. We're combining two beautiful materials together to make a totally unique new style of ring. We're gonna combine malachite true stone and gold. And the malachite's gonna go on the outside and the gold is gonna go on the inside of the ring and it's gonna look incredible. And the end result should just knock your socks off. So first up, what we need to do is cut down this malachite block into a usable slab. So we're gonna put this on a tile saw and cut it with a diamond blade with water running over it. And what this is gonna do is cut us a nice thin slab that we can actually cut a ring blank out of. Now we're gonna take the slab that we just cut off on the tile saw and we are going to put it on the drill press and hole saw it out with diamond hole saws. With true stone, it's important to keep it a little thicker than normal so that we can size it down later. So we're gonna cut out kind of a larger chunk right now. While I was working on this, I actually had an idea for another project on the side that goes along with this. And I'm pretty excited about it because I think it's gonna be really cool and go really well with this. All right, now that we have the blank, we're gonna take it over to the lathe to size it up so it fits on the gold liner. The reason I love working with true stone is because natural stone would be impossible to make as an outside of a ring like this. It's just gonna break, it's too brittle, it's not gonna work. Where with true stone, it is. It's going to be durable, it's gonna last a long, long time, and it's gonna be shapeable into a ring like this. True stone is made with natural stone, it's just been treated in a way that makes it durable to wear as jewelry. It's absolutely incredible material and it looks beautiful and that's why I prefer to work with it at any chance I can.
One of the most difficult things about bonding metal and true stone or any composite for that matter is making sure that bond is strong and permanent. And so we're going to go through a little extra effort here to make sure this gold is prepared properly so that it bonds to the malachite true stone exterior and stays there for a lifetime. Normally, if you're bonding two pieces of ring together, you can just rough up the sides and glue it together and it'll stay together forever. But in this scenario, we wanna make sure that this thing's anchored down permanently and is never going to come off with temperature changes, with daily wear and tear on your ring, whatever life might throw at you. So to do that, what we're gonna do is groove the gold and then when the epoxy fills in there, it's gonna create an anchor that's gonna bond the inside liner to the outside permanently so that they don't ever come apart. We're also going to rough it up too. So we have both grooves that create anchors as well as roughed up inside and outside of the blanks. While the adhesive cures, we're gonna go ahead and make something on the side. We're gonna make a pendant. The first step in making the pendant is we are headed back to the tile saw to cut out the pendant and get to work on it. We've got the raw pendant cut and we're gonna cut an offset stripe that we're gonna inlay gold flake into. And normally people would use a nice proper clamping system, but we just use carbon fiber sheets because we can. Now we're gonna carefully sand it and clean it up and get it ready to inlay. Now we're gonna inlay gold flakes, so we're gonna use some more of the glue that we were using before for the ring, and so we're gonna carefully inlay it in, piece by piece, making sure that everything is glued in permanently. After that's cured, we're gonna take it over real quick, give it a nice buff and polish it up and it's gonna look fantastic. It'll pair very, very nicely with the ring. Now that the pendant is done, we're gonna go back to the ring. So first up, we're gonna shave down some of the exterior. We're gonna make that into a nice height or thickness so it's a very comfortable ring to wear. I 
I'm hand shaping and sanding and polishing the exterior. And as soon as I finish, you'll see how beautiful this malachite really looks. It's a really, really beautiful material as a ring. Now onto the inside, we need to add comfort fit to the inside and sand and polish the gold up to a nice high gloss finish so it pairs really nicely with the exterior. Look at the results of this ring. Is this not incredible how it looks? It's just so beautiful and that malachite looks incredible on the exterior of the ring. Hello YouTube. In this video we're going to be making a really cool ring. You can see right here I've got a black ceramic ring blank. These are really cool and they I'll show you how it compares to my carbon fiber ring. It's just really dark and then ceramic's also really lightweight just like carbon fiber and it's also extremely scratch resistant so it's really hard to scratch one of these and what we're going to be doing is adding an inlay that includes some meteorite fragments I've got them in this little vial here it's held on there with a magnet and then we're also going to add some shavings in there just to add a little more just some interesting details to it and then we're going to add this black glow powder and what we've done here is we used green glow powder so just this right here I can get it glowing for you using just a UV light and then I'll turn off this overhead light so you can see it better there you can see that glowing and then I'll show you how this compares it's never as bright when you add color pigment to it so you can see that so that's uh, one of the downsides to doing black rings is because black rings especially need a lot of pigment to it to make it black rather than just a charcoal color um, but here's all these color pigments I've got and once again like I say in every single one of my videos I have links in the description to anything that you see me use and if it's something weird that you see me use that I don't have in the description let me know in the comments and I am really good at getting back to you there or other viewers might be helpful as well um, but here's all these glow pigments all I did was I got the black powder and then I added this green glow powder into this vial and then I mixed it until I got that it's a pretty dark gray color if I add more black powder to it it's not gonna make it very darker but it's gonna diminish the glow and then once we add the cyan acrylate glue to this it's gonna make it a lot darker just like how if you get something wet it looks darker same thing here so you don't need this to be black just make it a nice gray color so yeah this should be a really cool ring it'll I think the results are gonna be amazing just a really stealthy 
um, ring that has just kind of that secret glow to it that you only see at night. And then the meteorite to it, I think meteorites are just way cool. So that is just another detail that's going to make this ring really cool. So I'm just going to jump over to the lathe and we'll start making this. All right, here the ring is finished. I'm actually really impressed with the way this one turned out. I really like just the stealthy look it has. Even the meteorite in it, if it's not reflecting the light, it still goes pretty well unnoticed. And so if you have it on your finger, it's just a really dark ring with just some very subtle details that really help show up. And then if I turn off the light here, 
Here, I'll charge it a little bit with the flashlight. These UV lights work really well, or you can just use the sun. You can see it glowing just a little bit there. It's still pretty bright in here, but I have my camera's settings down to be pretty dark. There you can see it glowing a little bit. So yeah, there it is all finished. It's super lightweight, ceramics really scratch resistant, and so this will be a ring that will last a really long time and still look really good. So yeah, I'm really happy with the way this one turned out. If you have any questions for me, you can just leave them in the comments. I'll try to get back to you. And then I'll just show a bunch of photos and videos of it. And I'll see you guys in my next video. Thanks. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to my laboratory where safety is number one priority. So in today's video, we're gonna be using some more of this Damascus steel that was sent to us by Vegas Forge. You can check them out, link in the description. So we're going to be using this Spirograph Damascus that they sent us. You can't really see the pattern it has on it now unless we etched it in acid. So there's gonna be kind of a grand reveal at the end, and I really like rings like that. I think it makes for an interesting video where the ring totally transforms within the last 30 seconds of the video. So stay tuned for that. It's got a really cool look to it. It almost looks like snake skin. But this is actually going to be a custom order for a customer. So this is already sold, actually. And so we've got all of his information here. So we're going to be making it for him. So it needs to be a size 12 and a half. And then we're going to make it 8 to 9 millimeters wide. I told him 8 millimeters, but I think it might look a little bit better at 9 millimeters. So we'll shoot for somewhere in that range. And then he wants it to have that deep space look. And you've seen some of my other videos where I do the mix of the glow powders to give it kind of a dark, deep space. I do a lot of black and then swirl in some of the other colors. And so we're going to do that, but we're going to make it glow blue. Typically I do green because that's the brightest glow color. And on rings like the deep space where we have to add a lot of color pigment, that can actually detract from the glow brightness. And so this will be a little bit more subtle, the glow that it has, but it's still going to look nice and I'll show you some of those long exposure shots of it glowing. It'll look really cool actually. And then we're going to be adding meteorite pieces to it. So overall, this is going to be a really interesting ring. It's going to have a lot going on in it. It's this Spirograph Damascus, really exotic material. It's going to look beautiful. And then it's going to glow in the dark, which is also pretty cool. It's got meteorite in it. It comes from, straight from outer space. So that's really cool. It's got the deep space look to it. So I think this is going to be an interesting ring. A challenge to a lot of the rings like this is kind of like less is more. We don't want it to be too crazy, too much going on. But I think we will strike a good balance with this. There's not that much going on. This is just going to have a different texture. Other than that, it'll look like a fairly standard metal. And the deep space, there's a lot of black in there, and that's on purpose. It makes it a little more subtle with just a slight color pop to it. And then in the dark, it'll glow, but that's fine because you can't see the rest of the ring there. So those are kind of all the thoughts that I've got going into this ring. It's got a ton going on, but never at once is this just too flashy or anything like that. So this will make a cool ring, very interesting in all different types of lighting. So our first step, like with most rings that we make out of rods, is going to be to cut a slice of it. I've actually got a, another piece of, this is reptilian Damascus that we are like a third of the way through filming, not even, but basically just cutting a piece out like this and then we're going to be hollowing it out like we, you can see here. And then we'll be sizing it up to the size we need, doing some exterior shaping and all that, and we'll go from there. Boom diggity. Dig dog, dig dug. So step one, like I mentioned earlier, we're just cutting a slice of this off and I'm using my metal bandsaw here. I actually upgraded recently, this one's automated. So you just flip the switch on, you're able to walk away and then it just slowly but surely cuts that thing in half. You'll see me add a little bit of oil on it and you obviously want to monitor it because that's not safe. But once it's done, you can see it just turns itself off and then we've got our disc that we're ready to start hollowing out. And so you'll see I'm using a tungsten carbide center drill here and I just plunge it through all the way through the center of the disc and that gives us a starting point that I can then take my boring bar and then widen that hole up. And this Damascus steel, it's a stainless steel alloy that they use, the two different alloys in it, they're both stainless, and it is pretty tricky to machine. So you gotta make sure you're using sharp lathe bits, you're not removing too much material, a few things like that. But as long as you're careful, it does go by pretty well, it just takes a little bit more time than usual to complete the ring. 
So I'm getting it really close, but not all the way to the final inner diameter. And you can see I'm comparing it versus my notes here. And so I stop a couple fractions of a millimeter before, and that's to give it a little bit of extra strength while I do some of the shaping that you'll see me do here on the outside of the ring. Then once we're done with that, we'll go back and sand the inside out a little bit more so that'll be the proper ring size. Then using a left hand and a right hand lathe cutter, you see me even up the sides. That makes the two surfaces of the ring nice and flat and perfectly parallel to each other. And then using the Sharpie, I color the whole ring black. And then using the calipers, I measure out how big I want the edges of the ring. And then I scratch a little line into that Sharpie so that I can tell where to stop using these lathe cutters. And to actually form the channel, you see I switch between the left and right hand lathe cutters. That's to get really clean wall edges. And then once I'm done with that, I switch to this square shaped one. And then once I'm done with that, I switch to the flat shaped cutter. And that's to make sure the surface of our channel that we're carving is flat. Now it's at this point that I'm ready to go ahead and add the inlay materials. And so for the deep space, I like to do some of the purple amethyst and then some smaller chunks of the malachite. So you see I put in quite a few pieces of the amethyst. These are pretty subtle, but they will add a nice, and especially when they're surrounded by the black glow powder, they'll be a nice dark and subtle purple. So I think it really adds to the deep space look that we've got going. And then I use smaller chunks of malachite because it's completely opaque and I don't want it to take up too much space in the ring. So use a bunch of them, but smaller ones so that they're a little more subtle and they just add a splash of color wherever they are. And then the first layer of glow powder I do is just with the black powder. And I've actually never shown it on camera and I do want to do it soon, show how I mix the colors. So I start off with a completely uncolored white powder and then I mix in color pigments. And I've actually got some of those materials available on my supplies website if you're interested. I've just got a link down in the description. Then once I'm done with that first layer of the black powder, that's when I start sprinkling in some of the other colors. And I'm using three other colors, blue, green, and purple. And so if I get carried away, it'll be really easy to overdo it with the coloring on it. So you can see I do a light dusting of the colors almost everywhere. Of course, I deliberately miss a few spots on the ring because I do want there to be some darker black sections. And then I also want to have little patches of color. So for each of the colors, I'll give them kind of their own little spot on the ring. That way each color is individually showcased and you can see sections of it, but nothing's too overpowering. So for the majority of the space on the ring, you'll see a nice swirl of all the colors and that's what I'm really going for here. Now I've got everything added that we need and so I'm going to trim it down using a lathe cutter here. I just want to get it completely flush with the surface and once I get there you'll see I switch over to a square shaped cutter and this is important for rings like this that are etched in acid. The reason that I'm cutting the inlay down shorter than the metal is to give us room to completely seal the ring off and we'll use CA glue for that. So I'm going to polish it up because we won't be able to access this once we completely coat it. So I'm polishing the inlay up, making sure it's all good to go. And then now we'll start adding some of that CA adhesive. And you can see here, it looks great. We're ready to go. So I put on a thin layer of that CA glue. That's just to get everything coated. And then I do another layer or two and that's to make sure it's above the rim of the ring. And one thing to note, that first layer that I did, I was using a super thin CA glue. That way it could seep into any of the cracks. I'm hoping to completely seal off the inlay so that there won't be any acid infiltrating into, say, for example, the amethyst stone. So now I just trim the adhesive down, make sure that's flush with everything. And now it's time to add the bevels. And this is pretty simple. I'm just measuring out with the dials on my lathe how far to put the grooves. So I just use a left and right hand cutter for this and then I use the angled back section of it to give it that nice angle that we're going for. And then I need to do a final polishing here. The polishing step gives us a really nice finish on the inlay section in particular. 
and then we'll wrap the whole ring in electric tape and that'll be to protect that because that is our final finish. And then I'm ready to sand the inside out. And like I said, I'm making it a little bit wider so it'll fit on the finger better. But what I'm mostly doing here is grinding a comfort finish into it. So I'm making sure these edges are nice and round so they'll fit comfortably on a finger. Then I'll do a bit of sanding, make sure everything's really smooth and that there's no visible scratch marks. I'm not worrying about getting a perfect polish here because we definitely don't need it. We're going to be soaking this in acid and that'll completely eat away at the exterior of it. We just don't want any big grooves sanded into there because those can be visible after we etch it. So you'll see I finish one side, I flip the ring over, just repeat the same steps on that side as well. Now all of the machining is completely done on the ring. This looks amazing the way it is. This is what a stainless steel glowstone ring would look like. So we could call this a finished product. I think it looks really good. But we're gonna take it one step further and this is what really separates this ring from anything else. And this is kind of the coolest step that we're going to do. So we're going to soak it in ferric chloride and it's going to etch away one of the types of steel. So the way it works is that they combine two different alloys of steel. One of them will dissolve in acid faster than the other. There will be raised edges and that's where the metal that's more resistant to the acid is. So while it's etching, I let it go for about an hour or two and I made sure to flip it about every 30 minutes and that's to make sure our etching is even. Now we're ready for somewhat of a grand reveal. We will do one final step to make the pattern on it really pop, but here we go. So here you can see the ring. It actually looks way better than I even imagined it would look. This pattern is completely unreal. It looks like Spider-Man's costume or Spiderweb or something like that. It's incredible to look at and it's such a small pattern. That's one thing that's a challenge in rings. Most things don't have really small, intricate details to them. This definitely does. So this is going to look amazing, especially in some of the macro photos that I'll show at the end. But now, as a finishing touch, we'll take this over to the lathe. I'm going to sand down the ridges on this ring, polish them up so that they'll be extra shiny. That way, there'll be a lot of contrast between the two types of metal. So you can see I've got a piece of sandpaper and it's glued to this lathe bit I've got here. And the reason for that is because that keeps it rigid. That way, the sandpaper won't bend and conform to the material. That way it'll only sand those raged edges and that's exactly what we're going for. And the sanding does mess with the polish on the inlay section. So I do use the polishing compound on that to bring the shine back. But then after that we just have to do a little bit of simple sanding on the inside and we're totally finished. So I think this ring turned out seriously amazing. This is one of those rings that you spend all day making and it looks fine along the way, but it's really in the last 30 or so minutes of making it that it really starts to come together and it just looks incredible. And it makes all that time and effort totally worth it. I hope you agree that this was a worthwhile ring to make and a worthwhile video to watch. So if you like the video, make sure to give it a like. You can subscribe to my channel as well if you want to see my future videos. Hey, what's up YouTube? Welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be making two glowstone rings. And this is going to be a matching set of rings. And we're going to be using these three glow powders you see here. So the first one is this pinkish red. Then the next one is blue. And then the next one's black. And then all three of these actually glow purple. So you'll see right here in the glowing shot, they all glow purple. And so it's actually kind of interesting. They look different colors during the day, but at night they're all going to glow purple. And you can see those color samples underneath the three vials of what the colors are actually going to look like once they're wet with the adhesive. And then the next ingredient that we're going to add to this ring and something that I think is going to make it really special and cool is going to be diamond dust. And so essentially I'm just going to be taking these diamonds and crushing them with a hammer and then just making small little diamond dust particles. So that'll add a kind of a cool look to the ring. It'll give it a little bit of a sparkle and then also kind of make it look like space with just little stars interspersed everywhere. So I think that's going to be really cool. And you can see the way that I actually make the diamond dust is I'm literally just, I've got this steel block here and then smashing it with a hammer and as you know, diamonds are the hardest natural material. And so smashing them with the hammer here, it kind of mushed them into this steel, even though it's hardened steel. And so I just thought that was kind of interesting. It kind of messed up this block. It was fine. I just sanded it away, but, but that might be something to keep in mind. If you're going to try this yourself, 
don't go smashing little diamonds on something that you think is important. So I'm just crushing them up until I have a nice variety of particle sizes. So I've got a bunch of teeny little dust. I've also got some that have hardly even been touched um, and then plenty of everything in between. And so this will add a good variety of different sized particles to the ring. Now that we have all the materials ready to go for the rings, it's time to go ahead and begin adding the inlays. So I'm going to be using two identical tungsten ring blanks for this. And I mounted them side by side here and that's just so I could do everything at the same time. This is going to be a time saver for me, but more importantly, it's going to help me get the rings to look consistent. Because if I went back and tried this again, I might use a different method or for whatever reason, it might just look a little bit different. And I'm trying to make them matching. So I'm making them both at the same time and that'll ensure that they both look the same. So we start off like most of the other glowstone rings. I just add a little bit of this cyanacrylate adhesive. Then I go ahead and lay down the first layer of powder. And for this ring, I'm kind of going for a deep space effect. That's what the customer requested. So it's kind of a deep space with the blue and pinkish colors rather than the typical kind of purples and greens and blues that I do. So because this is a deep space ring, I'm going to start with the black powder and that ensures that the background of the inlay is always going to be black because that's the main color I want in here and then the other colors I'm just going to kind of try to swirl in here and pay attention to how I'm adding the other two colors. Um, I'm kind of lightly spreading them out evenly over a lot of the surface of the ring. Um, but I'm definitely leaving a couple of patches where it's just that color. And that's because if I went a little bit too light everywhere, it, the colors would all kind of mix and it'd just be kind of a gross brownish color. And that's not what I'm looking for. So I want to have colors that are definitely blue and definitely this pink color. And then of course, I still want to have some of the definitely black parts. But then it is also important to add a bit of that element of where it's spread out pretty evenly. I didn't add diamonds until I was about halfway through adding the inlay because those would have just been completely covered up. And so I, the first time I add them, most of these are actually going to be covered up, but a couple of them might show through, so I went ahead and added them anyways. Then I just went ahead and rotated through all the colors again, added another layer or two to the rings, and then we're at the point where we're ready to add the final diamonds that actually will show in the ring. So all I'm doing to add the diamond dust is going to be to just take a pinch of it with my fingers and then slowly spread it out pretty evenly throughout the entire ring. And once I've got a nice coating, I switch to the other one and then we're done there. Now that I've got the inlay completely added, I need to go in and trim it down so it'll be flush with the edge of the ring. And this is actually a pretty big challenge for this ring because diamonds are so hard, they just literally, they won't sand away. And so they're pretty difficult to get rid of. They end up popping out eventually of the inlay. So that's one thing to keep in mind. I did do my best to keep as many of the diamonds as I could below the surface of the ring, but there ended up being enough that I was just going through these sanding drums like crazy. I ended up using over 10 of the coarse sanding drums and then about three of the finer ones. But I eventually got through it all. Now I've got the inlay flush with the rest of the ring. So from here, all I need to do is sand everything smooth. And then I'm going to be using some diamond paste polish and that'll polish up the ring nicely. And if you're wondering why I use the diamond polish in this video versus some of the other polishing you'll see me do in other videos, it's because I had to be really rough on the tungsten in order to get the inlay flush. So there was a lot of scratching left over on the ring once I got it flush. And the diamond paste is able to actually cut through on the tungsten unlike most of the sandpaper and other polishing options and actually remove those scratches. So the sanding steps you'll see me do for these rings is going to be very similar to what you see me do for most of my other glowstone rings. The exception here is that I'm making sure to sand in both directions. So I put my lathe on forward and then I switch and put it on reverse. And that's because these diamonds are so tough and sticking out that sometimes when I'm sanding, the diamond will kind of protect the surface of the inlay behind it. And I will actually get to that. And so if I'm coming at it from both directions, I eventually get to it. And I'm going through a bunch of sandpaper, so I'm replacing it pretty frequently. And that's because the diamonds just shred through that aluminum oxide sandpaper. 
So now I've gone through all the grits of sandpaper, started with 220 and now I just finished with 800 here. And so now it's gonna be time for the diamond polishing. And you can see the five different levels I have. So we're gonna start with 40 micron diamond paste, move to 20, then 10, then three and a half, and then 0.5 here. And the number on it correlates to the diameter of the diamond particles. Like I was saying, that's in microns. So for the 40, it's 40 microns wide, and then the 0.5, it's 0.5 microns wide. So for the 40 micron paste, I'm gonna use a bunch of that. That's because that's the most important step. That's where we're gonna be doing most of the cutting action with the diamond paste. That's where we're going to be getting rid of the scratches. And then the steps after that are actually mostly just to get rid of any impurities left by the 50 micron. So now after finishing up with the 0.5 micron diamond paste, this one's done. And we're ready to move on to the sanding and polishing stage of the second one. And the steps here are gonna be the exact same, so I'm not gonna go into any of the details on that. We're doing the same, we're doing the same grinding down, then sanding, then polishing that we did on the first one, so I'll just kind of speed through this one. So let me know what you think down in the comments, guys. I think these rings turned out amazing. I really like that diamond dust inlay. I've never done that before. It was actually an idea by the customer, so I was really happy to have that. I think it turned out awesome. And then I also like the unique color patterns this ring has. It's the similar kind of deep space look that I try to do on a lot of my popular rings, um, but in different colors than I normally do. So it was a fun new thing to try. I think it turned out well in practice, and I really like the diamond dust. So if you like the video, go ahead and give it a like. If you're new to my channel and think you might want to see some of my other videos, go
Now we have all the components assembled and I'm just going to need to shape, size, sand, and then polish this bad boy and it'll be finished. And here it is all done. You can see this really cool red glow it puts off in the dark. Now I don't frequently use red glow as it's one of the dimmest glowing colors, but that's definitely not to say it's not one of the best looking colors when it actually is glowing. And I, I think it looks amazing. Anyways guys, I really hope you enjoyed this video. This was a fun ring to make and it did take me almost 10 hours to make it actually, but I'd say the results are definitely worth it. But let me know what you think in the comments and do let me know if you have any suggestions for me. Leave those down in the comments. Hey, what's up my dudes? Welcome back to the channel. So great to have you here. Today we're gonna be making a really interesting ring. We've got bogwood here on my right and then carbon fiber on my left. I'll give you a little close up action here. So two really cool materials. They're almost like polar opposites. So the bogwood, this is usually oak, but just any kind of wood that's been submerged under a bog. So it doesn't have oxygen and then it's in an acidic environment. So it turns it this really dark black color and it still maintains all of its structure. So you can still see all the wood grain and things like that. So really interesting, really old and really natural. And then we've got the brand new cutting edge technology that's completely unnatural. So both of these, we're combining them together, make for a really cool ring. And then let's not forget, this has that glow stripe in there. So this will glow in the dark. This will look amazing. And you can see, here's the piece that we cut them from. I actually have blanks of this cut out by the water jet channel for me so it just makes things quicker for me um, but this is how it starts off with it's a slab of the bogwood crack it on purpose and then fill it in with glow resin and then we are left with this so the reason I'm doing this video is because I found that these bogwood rings just the pure bogwood alone they're not super durable so they are susceptible to cracking and a few things like that and I've had a couple customers who's ordered theirs and they had it crack so I've just decided to have everyone send theirs back I'll put in a carbon fiber liner that'll make them super durable so that that's the idea here. We're gonna have a really durable ring that looks really cool, really unique, and is made with three special materials. We've got the carbon fiber, the bogwood, and then the glow resin. So very unique ring. This should be really awesome. We've got my boy Dustin here. He's gonna be following me around. We're gonna be doing a bunch of filming, cool slow-mo shots, all of that. And do make sure to stick around till the end of the video. I'll be inserting a bunch of photos of the bogwood ring glowing. And if you haven't seen one before, it seriously, it looks amazing. It's one of my favorite rings. It's such a cool, unique, look you can see some of the natural wood grain in there and then it's just glowing and a slightly transparent it's just super awesome to look at it's my favorite ring to look at in 
in the dark. But that's the basic rundown of the ring and a little bit of backstory as to why I'm doing it. Hope that was helpful. Now let's go ahead and get started. Not a smooth talker, under pressure. Sweaty palms ain't making it much better. Something about you feels so special. Pretty yellow from the minute that I met you. So I'm starting off here borrowing some footage from one of my older videos where I made a bog wood ring. So what I do today is actually a little bit different from the process you'll see here. I actually spent about a month experimenting with a bunch of different ways of infusing the wood and so I could stabilize it, make it waterproof, and then also a good method to add the glow resin to it. And so I do use a little bit of a different method now and it makes for a much more durable ring, but this will give you the general idea. Attention, you make me and then in the footage here, I'm using a hole saw to cut out the blank. But like I said earlier, I actually get them cut out with a water jet. But if this is something you wanted to do, you could follow the steps that I use. I just use a little bit more of some different equipment. I use a vacuum stabilizer and a pressure pot in order to get bubble free castings, things like that. But if you're just trying this at home, you could totally use the steps that I'm taking. So once we've got the blank separated, we need to hollow it out a bit more, and that'll be so we can fit the carbon fiber liner on the inside. And so I'm actually making it bigger than the final ring size that I want because I do need to fit that thin layer of carbon fiber in there. And you can see in these slow motion shots how the lathe's working. So it's just slowly, slowly removing material, and it's literally cutting it with that lathe bit as the ring rotates against it. Trying to get your attention, you make me nervous. So now I've got the inside of the bogwood section ready to go, and I need to take this smaller carbon fiber blank and do a similar process to it. And so I'm going to hollow out the inside just a bit so that it'll fit on a ring mandrel, but this isn't going to be the final size of the ring. Under pressure, sweaty palms ain't making it much better. Something about you feels so special. And then I need to very carefully trim down the outside and I'm doing it just enough so that the bogwood outside part will just barely fit over it. You wanna make sure it's a really nice tight fit. And then once we're at this point, we're able to actually glue the two together. So I'm just using CA glue here and I wanna completely coat the exterior of the carbon fiber piece. and then we will set it inside the bogwood and I'm just using this arbor press to crush them both together. Smoking outside, trying to get your attention. You make me nervous. In the corner of my best friend's sofa, you were getting by some rum and cola Wasn't brave enough yet just to talk to you And then I'll just squirt a couple sprays of the CA glue accelerator and it'll be completely hardened and we'll be ready to move on to the next step which will be trimming and sanding everything down with this belt sander here. Now using this Dremel, I get it really close to the final size we want. The Dremel sandpaper is pretty rough and so I am being careful to stop before. And this is a size eight ring, so I go to about a seven and a half. And then later I'll use sandpaper and do that by hand to get a really smooth finish and give it the exact size we want. 
And now it's time to mount it back onto the ring mandrel and we'll be using the lathe to shave down the outer diameter of it and that'll be to get it to a comfortable ring thickness. And then you'll see I'm using this super thin CA glue. It's actually about as thin as you can get it. And it runs even better than water. So it's very thin and it's able to seep into any little pore or crack inside of the bogwood. And so even though this is already resin stabilized, we're able to actually take it a step further here. So that fills in anything that the stabilization wasn't able to take care of. It makes for a really nice and smooth wood surface and it makes it a lot more water resistant. Now it's time to put the ring back into the lathe jaws and this will be where I take it to that final size. And so I'm doing this all by hand with sandpaper. I'm starting with 220 grit, that's pretty rough. And then working my way all the way up to 1200 grit. And Cola wasn't brave enough yet just to talk to you. Not a smooth talker. And you'll see I have to flip the ring around so I can make sure to get both sides. And then once I'm done with that, I use these two polishing cloths. So one has a medium polish and one has a high polish on it. So that'll give the carbon fiber a really nice high gloss finish. Now we're finally able to move on to the last step. So we're going to be putting it back onto the mandrel one last time. And you'll see I put tape around the mandrel this time and that's to protect the inside finish on that carbon fiber. We just spent a lot of time getting that and I do not want to scratch it. So that's just a precaution I'm taking there. And then I use sandpaper to polish it all the way up. And then I go over to my polishing wheel and I start with a medium polish like I did on the inside. And then same as the inside, I finish with the green high polish. Making it much better Something about you Feels so special Pretty up from the minute that I met ya And as a final touch, I actually did put a little bit of ring wax on the outside of the ring. And so what that does is it gives it more of a matte finish, and then it also gives the wood itself a more natural look. So I think it adds to the overall aesthetic of the ring. And there is actually a visible difference you can see from when I was showing it off right after polishing it to these final more finished photos where the ring has a better and more natural look to it. But that's going to be it for this video, guys. Thank you all so much for watching. This was a really fun ring to make, and I think the results make for a ring that was even better than the original Bogwood ring. And the fact that we're combining materials here makes it just much more interesting, in my opinion. So let me know what you guys think down in the comments. I really do appreciate your guys' feedback. It really helps us out. We're able to make the best videos that you guys want to see. And it's also really helpful to know what you guys think of the ring itself. So if you like the ring, let me know if you think it could have been improved by certain steps or certain materials. Let me know that as well. I'm super open to feedback and I love interacting with you guys. And speaking of that, if you go to my Instagram and follow me there, I've actually got a lot less followers there. So that's somewhere that I love to interact with you guys because I'm able to actually see and reply to almost every comment. So, so if you've got a comment that you really want me to see, leave it on one of my Instagram posts. I'm able to read all of those and I just love interacting with you guys. It's a lot more of a tight knit community. So thank you all for watching. Leave a like if you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next one.